All right. Good afternoon. I got my co-host here. Um, and um, it's another wonderful Monday afternoon in Advocacy Arena. So glad to have you here. Hi, Joseph. You can. Um, I'm going to invite you up to speak. Um, look forward to hearing from you today. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started um, a little bit and let the room um, kind of fill up. And I expect that we're going to have some great conversation here today. And I just want to say welcome to Advocacy Arena, the place to bring awareness and solution-oriented focus to important societal issues. I look forward to a wonderful conversational roundtable today to and hopefully it will help educate and inspire civic engagement uh, community coalition building and some grassroots initiatives and uh, we seek to amplify uh, those kinds of initiatives here as we discuss the current events and hot topics of um, the day the week um, and um, it is going to be lively and I have Mark here and he already told me he was going to be fired up um, as I think a lot of us are, and some of the, you know, the hot topics that, of course, I think that we should and would will be discussing today involve the um, new bill passed in Florida, and uh, of course, the assault, uh, the continuing assault on education, which, you know, kind of goes back to a, co a topic conversation that I've been having for a while, and that is dark money and the front groups that they use uh, to push their agenda. And Moms for Liberty is one of those front groups, and they are very active in um, the uh, educational front, um, basically picking up the mantle from the UDC, which I like to talk about a lot. I did a thread this weekend that I will be putting up in the nest and I hope it continues to get amplified so people can see these connections and the move that they made in Florida was really kind of um, just another um, glaring example of the UDC's lost cause, um, you know, agenda, you know, going and staying into effect. So. Without further ado, um, I, and I also, a couple of other topics that I hope that we can get into certainly is, you know, kind of an update on uh, where the indictments are, because this is the summer of strikes and indictments. And I have a fabulous co-host here who can really speak to the, the union issues that are um, percolating in the country now. So when, when I turn it over to her, I'm going to give her an opportunity to address some of that. But I also hope that we can cover the um, map in Alabama. I see Black Stem here. I'm hoping we can get a kind of a, a tech update from her, especially with some of the things going on with the social uh, networks um, and all. And um, let's see, the maps in Alabama, the indictments, um, Oh, and uh, definitely want to talk about, I haven't had a, a lot of time to delve into it, but just enough knowledge to know it is another glaring example of the danger that our democracy is in. And that is that the Heritage Foundation, one of the big dark money donors, um, has already implemented a trans presidential transitional um, team and they have called this project um, an initiative and it's called project 2025 so keep your eyes and ears open for that um, because basically it is um, a red glaring flag of their desire to change our country from a democracy into an autocracy uh, simply to hold on to their reins of power and as i said without further ado I am going to turn it over to my co-host while I put some things up in the Jumbotron. I send out some invites and we get our conversation started and I'm looking forward to it today. So, so sister, over to you, my dear. And I'm going to uh, get Mark and Joseph up. I know Black Stem was here. She may have lost connection. Hopefully she'll come back. Like I said, looking for, you know, kind of an update from her if we can at some point in our conversation. But how are you this afternoon? Thank you so much, Dee. I'm doing very well, thank you. Um, just glad to be here, and I do think that we're going to have some pretty vigorous conversation. Looking forward to it. Um, 
the summer of strikes. That's where we are. Um, you know, it is it is a little profound that um, oftentimes politicians don't pay much attention or uh, speak vocally, maybe, about uh, unions until election time. Well, um, all of these strikes are kind of heading off that election time talk, and so it's starting much earlier. And um, we're at a at a stage in this country where the unions have are, are not they're, they're not playing they're, they're not playing that game of we're going to just sit back and take it and hope for the best. Um, striking is always a very serious um, decision because. You know, workers do lose during a strike. They're not getting paid. Um, their benefits are are are, are not what uh, they would be if they were working. You know, they're depending on the strike fund of their own union, and um, but it is enough. Uh, the 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 challenges that they're facing, um, the disparities that they're facing, the injustices that they're facing on the job are enough for them to make this sacrifice to stand up. And it's, it's, it's a well-known historical fact that um, the benefits received by union that are negotiated, I shouldn't say received, let me be real clear. Um, companies and corporations wouldn't give you anything if they didn't have to. The negotiation process is really about uh, demanding what you should already be freely given as a as an everyday um, run of the mill. I, that's a bad term. Um, the working people. It, it's not. It's it, it's it's. There is a very big falsehood in this country, and has been for years. And I don't know that the taint of that will ever. Um, fall off of unions that that the con that the company would freely give you something and and you wouldn't have to negotiate if if you know you got rid of the union you'd still be able to keep these things that's just simply not true the reason why benefits are given is because there is a contract a legally binding contract between the parties and the benefits received by union members then also translate into those who are not. Um, covered by union contracts, you know, the 40-hour work week, um, health care. Um, in the past, it was pensions. Now they have 401ks that are pretty much guaranteed at um, most companies uh, for, for many different levels of jobs. But that's not, it, it hasn't always been that way. And so we're looking at the fact that it's not just although the news is very much highlighting it, it's not just SAG and WGA. It's not, it's not, so it's not just the TV movie stars, the people, the writers and the writers rooms and, 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 and entertainers. There's also the UPS workers, you know, those friendly people in the brown uniforms that pull up and drop off the packages that make us all so happy and, and keep us functioning um, uh, from day to day. It, there's also, um, there are some teacher unions that are sh striking. They sh they actually went on strike in May in Chicago, um, and there is also the threat that the United Auto Workers will also be on strike this summer. And right now, there's no um, there's no indication that it won't be with all of the Detroit Three automakers, which would be pretty profound and have a serious impact on the economy. Um, there's also, I, I mean, just looking today, it was just amazing to me how many people um, or how many unions are are dealing with um, negotiation uh, issues right now. And we need to be cognizant of it because it, it's going to affect our daily lives, but not just that. We need to be cognizant of it because what they're fighting for are the same things that we, in this space, all say is important to us. Um, 
you know, getting rid of pay disparity, um, fighting for a health care that, that is reasonable and um, affordable for people, um, wages that you can live off of. It, it's pretty serious uh, at this point, especially as we move into our new techn technological age and era and how that's going to affect people. If we don't get some safeguards in place, um, everyone is going to be affected on some level. There won't be any industry that is not touched. So I do applaud and definitely support all the SAG after WGA uh, workers and, and, you know, uh, for highlighting all of the injustices that are taking place in, in Hollywood and how it's affecting uh, not the big stars in the sense, but in the little people, you know, um, the electricians, the grippers, the, um, uh, those people. Uh, I don't know all of the, the, the job classifications, but you, you, the people that are usually unseen, but still need to maintain um, a living, healthy lifestyle to provide for themselves and their families. It, it's very important. So if it takes Hollywood to highlight the benefits of the union and why it's important, then I'm all for it. I, I'm very happy. Now, for I do want to point out that the UAW president, Sean Fain, has not endorsed um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris for uh, the 2024 election. And I think people on the GOP side, or at least uh, on the MAGA side, the former guy thinks that he can somehow seduce that that vote based on these, um, uh, these criticisms coming from the UAW uh, regarding electric vehicle um, policies. Um, Sean Fain is asking that they kind of... Uh, be slowed down to to give it a to make them less strict and i think he's holding those negotiation talks between uh this administration and the uaw um a little bit of hostage until he gets something that he feels that uh the membership can live with and you can't fault him for that it may not be um he may not be doing uh operating in the the uh, less aggressive, uh, you know, he's, he's being very aggressive about it. And, you know, maybe he, maybe that's not the way to do it, or maybe that's not the way we think he should be doing it. But I have to believe that he's being sincere about looking out for the workers. And, um, I think we all should, you know, pay attention, dig in and learn some more about it and, uh, try to support what's, what's happening right now. Um, in in our country in regards to that um but i do not believe in any by any stretch of imagination regardless of the fact that this was probably not the president that people thought was going to head up the uaw i do not think there's any world that we live in that he would be uh throwing support behind the former guy, just based on just based on his union policies in his past administration, let alone the human rights policies, because we need to um, recognize, or at least I know I recognize, and I'm hoping that you will too recognize that uh, the UAW and many unions who fall under the AFL-CIO, which is the big umbrella that. Um, most of the unions in this country um, subscribe to um, for support, uh, funding, and other necessary um, support that they might need in the future, whether it's organizing, whether it's helping with strikes, whether it's uh, for political um, uh, you know, lobbying for uh, legislation that benefits workers. I, no one is going to disregard the fact <clears throat> that the former guy was and is uh, an enemy of human and civil rights on just about every level that you can think of. I don't think that there is a bottom that he has not uh, ventured to or that he will go to. Um, so I, I want us all to be cognizant of the strikes. I, I will, 
I'm going to put some articles in the nest and I just found the teachers union one. So I'll get that up there in, in a minute. Um, but just these unions, are, I mean, these locals are all around the country. And if there's any way that you can support, I don't care if it's taking a case of water to a picket line that might be in your area or if, you know, you, you find yourself uh, getting one of those. I, I was reading an article the other day and I got a stupid survey before I could even continue reading an article. And it was from YouGov.com. And I cannot stand um I cannot stand that. I feel like it's, uh, I, f I feel offended that um, in order for me to continue reading, I have to answer the survey. But if you find yourself in that position, I hope that you answer the survey in support of um, unions and democracy. Anyway, I'll get off of that. Well, thank you so much. And I, like I said, I'm so glad that you um, are able to be here today, that you're my co-host and that you have the background and expertise in this area um, at um, this particular time. Um, you can speak to it in a way that not many others can. So I really appreciate that. And I am sure that uh, many in our audience uh, will as well. And I want to thank you guys all for being here today. I do have a few speakers up and I know that Mark will be coming up later. And if um, Black Stems internet holds up uh, without any connection problems. Uh, I hope that she will come up when it's convenient for her to, as I said, to give us an update kind of on um, what's going on um, with the, the social uh, networks um, and things these days. But without further ado, I am going to turn the mic over to some of our fabulous speakers that we have up, and that would be Joseph. And then up next is T-Bug. And I want to thank you guys for being here. Please share, retweet the space, and um, don't be shy. Come on up and join us in the conversation. And as I said, uh, I'm hoping to uh, delve into uh, more about uh, the assault on our education, how it ties in with the um, uh, assault um, that we are currently seeing and um, how that ties into our history and the history of other awful organizations in this country that all tie back into, you know, the Fourth Amendment. And this is uh, all of these activities and things really speak to the backlash um, of advancements that minorities have gotten every time it's it's just the way the the pendulum swing or um how our political system has operated um it we make gains you know as in after the civil war the um reconstruction um amendments the 13th 14th and 15th and uh, shortly after that we have the formation of the Ku Klux Klan the United Daughters of Confederacy all pushing back in their own ways to stop the advances that have been gained and we fast forward a, a, you know a bit in history um, we make further gains on that fourth amendment because this is where the civil rights uh, movement uh, made gains uh, and built up on the 14th amendment uh, rights and um, we got backlash. Oh, uh, well, before that, Brown versus Board, uh, because people did not want schools integrated. And, you know, before that, that I guess Plessy, and I'm sure Mark can cover and, and, and re uh, discuss some of those things, but, you know, Plessy, and then, um, you know, pushback from that, even though he didn't win, it was uh, just another example of us continuing uh, our work and our efforts uh, to to gain our rights. So um, I do have our speakers and I don't want to take any more time because we're going to be talking about this quite a bit. But I just want you to kind of put those things in mind because what has happened now, the backlash that we're getting is really from the George Floyd uh, kind of movement, the Black Lives uh, matter movement uh, created a lot of backlash. And so when we see these kinds of extreme, aggressive and violent behavior, understand where they're coming from. And they all speak to the backlash of gains uh, and advancement for other minorities, all in the name of white supremacy. So enough from me for now. We're going to go with Joseph T-Bug, Blackstem and um, then Mark. 
Hello, Miss D. How are you? I'm great. How are you this afternoon? Fine, thank you. And uh, hello, Soul Sister. Always nice to uh, to see you as well. Um, so while you kind of got me thinking about a lot of a lot of stuff, and actually, the last couple of days I've been thinking about, you know, how I learned history when I see these attempts to um, to rewrite history and people rationalizing trying to say that slavery was beneficial um i was thinking about it yesterday i think the youngest i can remember learning about slavery i think i was in fifth grade the first time i learned about it and you know i don't remember too many specifics i remember we learned about the underground railroad um we learned about the uh, uh, the Massachusetts with 54th Regiment in the Civil War. Um, and I remember my teacher read, uh, read us the uh, um, Sojourner, Sojourner Truth's uh, Ain't I a Woman uh, speech. Um, but it, everything basically boiled back to the fact that slavery was wrong. That's what we were taught, that slavery was wrong. I mean, anybody with, you know, with an ounce of sense knows that slavery was wrong. And then when I got into high school, when I took American history, obviously learned a little bit more in depth. I learned about uh, a lot of the cases, Ms. D, that you just uh, you just mentioned, um, uh, particularly when we're talking about the 14th Amendment. That sticks out in my mind because I remember learning about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments uh, in high school after, you know, when we're talking about the post-Civil uh, War era and how that, I mean, I have tied that back into Obergefell um, because that was the whole, that was the whole point of it, that the same-sex marriage bans were a clear violation of the 14th Amendment. And I think so many things that we're seeing right now, and I mean, maybe Mark might might speak to this, or I might have to uh, ask him aside. But it just seems that so many of these proposed laws would be violations of the Fourteenth Amendment. And uh, I have to go back and look through my tweets. I think I might have mentioned it maybe two or three years ago. Um, but there's an event in the Reconstruction era that sticks out in my mind that I think really laid the table. Um, for Jim Crow and so many things that were we even see today, and that was the uh, the Compromise of 1877 um, after President uh, Rutherford Hayes took office, um, because the uh, 1876 election was hotly contested, and while uh, you know President Hayes you know won, and I believe he was a, a pretty ardent abolitionist. Um, in the pre-Civil War uh, era. Um, but the compromise with the Democrats at the time was because President Hayes was a Republican, um, was to basically end uh, Reconstruction and pull federal troops out of the South. And as we know, I mean, that really set the stage for the development of the KKK and the, you know, the right, because it, it, it helped the, the rights. What it did was it, 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 um, it gave us rights, but it also gave the states rights, which they didn't um, really oppose. And it allowed the South to institute, you know, um, the uh, Jim Crow um, and black code laws that they were able to enforce forever until. Yeah. Right. 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 And another thing, and I'm going to go back through my tweets and look and see when I tweeted this. I think this was probably again, probably like two, three years ago. I think really a lot of what we're seeing today is the problem of the fact that after the civil war people romanticized the confederacy instead of uh you know taking it to the you know to the trash can like what what the germans did after world war ii with uh with nazism um i mean there's nothing to I'm, I'm sorry joseph let me you, you said what did you say they uh romanticized it and that is precisely the work because of the work of the united daughters of the confederacy and they chose um to do that they basically revised history to make it more romanticized for the behavior and the acts on, uh, of the South and to continue 
uh, painting black people and marginalized people as, you know, less than human, subhuman, and not deserving of the same rights that they did. Yeah. And I just, you know, I, 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 again, so much of what we see today, I think can be traced back to, to a lot of those things. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's very frightening in, in some ways. Um, uh, last night, I should say very early this morning, I was, uh, I was wide awake and I had a, uh, not really a dream, but I was like kind of having a vision about the uh, the Holocaust, and I was like picturing the uh, the gas chambers at Auschwitz, and like I could hear all the the screams of the people that were being murdered, and it was uh, absolutely terrifying. And I, you know, I legitimately worry that stuff like that can happen again if the wrong people get in power, because you know when you see somebody like. DeSantis, who is just pure evil and hell bent on, on on making life a living hell for anybody that isn't white or heterosexual, you know, or Christian, it's it, it, it's absolutely uh, terrifying. And we know, of course, what the former guy is all about. And you know, it's uh, it's scary. But I think. Um, you know, and as you've allude, alluded to it a couple of times, Ms. D, our our group is so broad and diverse and we have concentrations on so many different areas, different parts of the country that I think through our mobilization efforts, I think we're going to be able to prevent these people from taking power again. Um, I, I think we really do have a lot of momentum on our side going into 2024. Um, so with that, I'll land my plane there. I'll sit back and listen to everyone. And if uh, something else occurs to me, I will come back up. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Joseph. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, you don't have to go anywhere, but uh, all great points. And that is kind of the point of our conversation. And what we're trying to do is to make everyone aware and help them to understand. And this, again, is why history matters. It's important. And it's important that history be accurate. So thanks again, Joseph. Uh, up next would be T-Bug, then Black Stem, and then Mark. Yeah, um, hi. I was just... Um, How you doing? Well, pretty good for Monday. Um, okay. You know, there's a lot of stuff that gets overwhelming and discouraging, so every time there's like a little bit of hope, um, I get excited. I've followed the Vox Party in Spain. Um, and done a lot of research on them, um, as well as the other ones in Europe. And so I just um, posted an article, like a gift article, about their elections yesterday and how the Vox Party was rejected and their center-right allies as well, which gives the Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez um, possi the possibility to form a progressive government. Um, and uh, the article kind of talks about part of the the reason is they were they were attacking the LGBTQ community, and um, you know people started to get more aware, and they're and they're pushing back on that. So it just makes me, um, you know, it's making people in Europe more hopeful that are trying to fight against that, and me as well for what we can do in 2024. Um, like I said, like last week, we we defeated a lot of the right wing. Um, UDC, Moms for Liberty people in our election in Oregon by being organized. Um, so just thought I would share some good news. Well, thank you. And I, appreci I appreciate that because we do like to um, cover some of the jail um, events that are going on. And maybe if Allie comes in later, she can speak to it as, as well because it is important. I saw that and I'm glad you spoke to it. It is important for us to know and understand what's going on in other countries because this push toward fascism, as we've had the conversation so many times in um, these spaces, um, when I was in Democracy First and doing that as well, about the encroachment of fascism and that it was not just here. It is a global movement. 
and um, it always has been because it, you know, originated in Italy. It soon uh, spread to France and Germany. They took on different iterations in those countries, uh, but and 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 in Russia. But the same thing is going on here. Also, just a gentle reminder that Steve Bannon, you know, he hasn't gone anywhere, and um, his hand is still very much in this, and that he went to Italy uh, really trying to continue the spread of this uh, fascistic um, ideology. And he was so bad that the home of fascism, they kicked him out. Now, they did go on later to, you know, um, actually elect someone who, uh, you know, has direct descendant ties to, you know, um, El Duce. But um, again, a, par a parliamentary type of government, um, she has only been able to do so much. And um, the good thing is, is that uh, she has continued to support Ukraine. And that is in part, too, that people recognize that Ukraine is on, is fighting for democracy for all Western countries, especially those in Europe. So, you know, Ukraine's um, national security, uh, their ability to to win this war um, has a direct dependence of, you know, the other uh, Western uh, European countries also uh, have a vested interest in that. So again, thank you for bringing that geopolitical uh, point to the conversation. And um, up next, we've got Black Stem and then Mark. <laughs> Um, hi there, D, and also to Soul Sister and the rest of the of the um, of the audience. Um, D asked me to come and share what I know about the changes that are happening to Twitter. And so, what I'd like to do, even though it's kind of interrupting the flow of the discussion, is I'd just like to share with you what I have learned going back over the last week. And actually back to last October when Elon Musk uh, took, famously took his um, sink into Twitter, which is now X, and called himself Chief Twit, which I think today now he is Chief X. So let me just share uh, what I know. I'm not a IT expert, but I do know, I do understand business and a little bit of branding. Uh, what's happening with Elon Musk is Elon Musk has determined, uh, rightfully so, that he is losing money on his investment, his purchase of Twitter, which is now X. The recent data shows that his revenues are down by about two thirds. The average time that a user spends on Twitter now uh, varies between three and five minutes. There are more people that are spending time off of Twitter, I'm sorry, X, than are on. And so he has a situation where he's made a bunch of promises to investors that have backed him with a lot of money, and he's now showing that he's not able to deliver. So what he has grasped upon which was sort of uh, something that he talked about last October, is that he wants to change X, the X platform, into the every, meaning he wants it to take over LinkedIn, Amazon. Stem, Black Stem, we lost you a little bit. Check your mic. Okay. Um, she has been having some connection issues, and um, I don't know, maybe we're, you know, hurting someone's feelings, sharing too much knowledge. <laughs> about things but uh stem come back if you can when you can stay up here if you need to go out and come back it's okay um i know it kind of interrupts the flow of the um the conversation but i do think it's important for people to know this and to understand this and i really do appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come um and and share with us so uh we're gonna move on to mark and we'll pick back up uh where we left off and if stem comes back in we're going to let her give us that um that uh, social media update so mark my friend how are hey, you hey d how's it going and, and hi advocacy arena yeah. um i love the space as you know i do because we always talk about things that you know we i get to refer to it the next week or 
a couple months down the line and say, right. Hey, hang on, Mark. Uh, let me see if, uh, sure, sure. Cause I was um, actually, I was actually, uh, listen, I was actually listening to her cause I, I was interested too. It's so very, if she, if she, yes, can, if she can yes. continue, I'd rather her continue it. And like, I can break in back into the 14th amendment and stuff. Okie doke. All right. Black Sam floor is yours. Can you hear me now? Yes. I think, X is trying to keep me from sharing this information with you guys, so I apologize. I'll go as fast as I can since um, since I'm being threatened by X. Um, so what e Elon Musk has done is he's got a bunch of investors that are saying, look, you got to start delivering. And so what he has latched on to is a couple of things. Number one, he's latched on to the fact that there's been no uh, Twitter alter uh, X alternative to this point that has been able to uh, capture and retain um, the initial users that sign up to it. Threads um, dropped by 50%. Their users dropped by 50% after the first week. Um, there have been others such as Mastodon, um, Spill, uh, Spoutable, uh, Post that have demonstrated some element of the same uh, decline after surges in people signing up. So this is verified to Elon Musk that right now there is no competitor that can successfully sustain um, against uh, his platform. The second thing is that he has also latched onto the idea that large language models, which is what the chat GPT and all of the open AI stuff, artificial intelligence stuff is is rapidly changing, um, that he has identified that that's going to be a way for him to make a ton of money in his mind. And then lastly, he has also confirmed that despite everyone's anger towards him, no one's really leaving uh, Twitter now X. Um, the reason being is because most of us have been here for a while. We have networks of people that we uh, we share information with. And unfortunately, when you leave um, the X platform, uh, Musk has, has um, successfully blocked your ability to um, bring along your friends uh, from the platform onto whatever other platforms you're, you're moving into. So... Um, now, the reason why this is not causing a lot of concern in the business world is because his CEO, Linda Yaccarino, she is behaving as a normal CEO. Um, she is delivering the messages that typical CEOs that take over troubled businesses deliver. She's telling everybody, look, um, the number one concern everybody has is is hate and um, abuse on the site. So that's where her focus, that's what she's communicating to all the Twitter advertisers, to the European Commission that looks at data um, compliance. She's communicating the right messages to all of the leaders. She's even inviting advertisers to come in and help get into the uh, coding of, of the X platform and figure out ways that they can get their ads close to the messages that the users are putting out that they want. So while Musk seems to be erratic in what he is doing, he definitively has a master plan that Linda, who is uh, the yin or the yang to his yin, is successfully communicating to the world. So here's what you need to know um, about what's happening. Number one, um, there was just a, a tweet that went out about five minutes uh, into this uh, session that says now there is going to be a request that will flag, will come up on your um, Twitter or X, um, uh, X screen. Uh, it will ask you if you can allow one, I believe it's one gigabyte byte of storage on your phone for the new X platform um, content. Um, be careful saying yes to this because essentially what it's going to do is it's going to have to go through your entire phone uh, to make sure that it understands exactly how much storage you have allocated uh, for the different apps on your phone until it finds 
a, a way to collect a total storage that meets its needs, it's going to be combing through your phone. So if you don't want Elon Musk and the X platform to crawl through your phone, uh, you need to be very, very careful how you answer and respond uh, when it asks you if it can use storage. Um, the second thing is that he is teasing everyone by saying, if you stay with me and you pay for Twitter Blue, I will reward you back with um, with money. I will put ads into your tweets, or I mean your exes. I will publish your long exes so that you can have a book on, on X platform. I can do all these things and eventually... Um, as I bring on AI, I'll be able to help you connect everything that you do in your life through this one platform, and you'll be able to make money um, magically as you go through the day. Um, again, not a lot of details there, but it looks like what he's trying to do is basically entice people. If he can't get you to stay um, because of the uh, of the environment, he'll get you to stay because you want to make money off of him. Um, and then the last thing is that Linda Yaccarino, whenever she's done interviews to the public, she's always used the term marketplace, that uh, the X platform is going to be the marketplace of everything. She is not using the term community. Uh, she rarely uses the term uh, public town square uh, she uses the term marketplace which is a business term it means that she is going to be looking at financials how do we get money flowing through the use of the x, pl x platform how do we get revenue flowing through the x platform so all of these um, spaces and activities that everybody's been doing on on x to organize prepare for elections elections to share climate change information to share COVID information what they're basically telling you is they're not they're not even really gonna make sure that continues their focus is to get into your wallet into your pocketbook they want to be your banking option they want to be the place where you get your job they want to be the place where you order your groceries they want to be the place where you basically do everything in your life that has to do with money and if you get into arguments with people on the side, uh, that's just an extra extra bonus. So that's my analysis. And Jack Dorsey uh, sent out his first X today. He His comment in his uh, X was, keep calm and just X through it. And there's a double meaning there. If you know uh, Jack Dorsey, you know he typically has a double meaning to everything that he posts uh, when he sends out messages. So that's basically what's going on. And uh, the business world is lukewarm to this. Uh, they've heard Elon make promises before. Uh, they're sitting back to watch and see what happens. Um, but basically, Elon has decided that he's going to get into your wallets. Thanks. Thank you so very, very much. And I am so glad that you were able to maintain connection until you could get us that information. Um, and I hope you guys will uh, take heed. And please, again, it's another great reason to share this space. There is always great um, information um, that can be had. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day to do that. Um, and... Um, we welcome you to stick around. Um, and again, I want to encourage everyone to share and retweet the space. Um, I do, you know, do DM invites, but I don't know what X is going to do uh, about it because I feel like every move he makes is basically being designed to shut down our, you know, our voices and our ability to um Commun uh, communicate with each other and strategize. He's basically tearing down the town square that has been built here. And quite frankly, it is really the only reason that I have stayed and been so involved on Twitter because it is a virtual town square. Um, and case in point is this conversation, the space that I'm having now. Uh, it allows us to come together to express ideas, to share information. And, you know, when the time comes 
to actually strategize and, and plan um, things. And he is trying to to stop that. And um, so I am still continuing. I'm going to be here until it evaporates, as I have said. But I'm building community elsewhere. And I encourage you guys to, to find me on those platforms and you two to uh, not put all your eggs in one basket and certainly not the X basket <laughs> uh, for so many reasons. But you know, look for Advocacy Arena on, on the um, other platforms um, that, um, you know, are out there and available. I am really trying to build stronger community on Spoutable, Spill, and on um, YouTube, as well as Substack. So look for me on those places. And I, like I said, just advise you to start building community and finding your community on those other places because it's only going to get worse here so thanks again uh black stem appreciate you and now back to the 14th amendment backlash mark you have the floor hey hey thank you d and and again black stem thank you so much for that uh um update and i i literally listened to everything you said and i appreciate you for explaining that because i i didn't i don't know what the hell's going on i'm like should i change my name to mark x like you know are we all x like you know I'm like malcolm x coming back like what's going on um but um before i get started um i want to net i'm gonna let everybody i'm gonna let everybody know that everything i have to say from here on out is about the constitution um somewhat specifically the 14th amendment um but generically uh, everything that is, is is supposed to mean. Um, I was I was provoked and affected last week uh, by um, the Florida Board of Education and, and their curriculum for middle schoolers on on slavery, um, with the African American history curriculum and the progeny of slavery and how it affects our perspective uh, today. So, um, I, I you know in, indulge me for a minute. Give me a give me a little bit here because. Um, this is like very personal to me because my mama went out and she spent a lot of money buying an ebony black encyclopedia in the late eighties, early nineties and made me read it. And I hated reading it, but I had to read it. And little did she know that in particular, in particular, I would have to regurgitate some of the information, not just regurgitate, but like, also like, you know, talk about some of the information that I learned. By reading the Ebony Black Encyclopedia, if anybody remembers that, like you know, give me a shout out because uh, not not a lot of people remember the Ebony uh, Black Encyclopedia. Uh, okay, that and 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 again, you know, the the Ebony and Jet magazines were a great source of information for us when I was growing up. Um, because in that era, right? Because at even at that time, we weren't being taught history correctly. Um, so let me start with let me start where the country starts. As the preamble to the our our founding document says, we the people in, of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. That and you've heard me talk about this before. That phrase to me illustrates our our endeavor to continually improve and and perfect our society. Right, it's a principle rooted in our nation's foundation, and highlights our commitment to democracy advocacy arena, justice, and the welfare of our citizens. So when the Florida Board of Education, and you're going to see how I'm connecting this with the 14th Amendment and the Constitution in a minute. Because it, it means something, especially in particular to cases like Milligan, cases like Dodd, cases like uh, the SFFA versus uh, UNC and affirmative action, it means a lot. It means a lot more than than just the state of Florida. Um, this proposal that there were some perceived benefits arising from slavery, um, it, it, it has initiated, and I, and I was provoked again, I, it initiated a profound and necessary dialogue. Um, but it also, I wanna make absolutely clear, if I have not done so in my, in my tweets and my Twitter and my ex, I guess it's called it excerpts, and my excerpts, whatever you wanna call it now, um, there were absolutely no benefits conferred to the victims of slavery. These claims, I don't care what kind of scholars, I don't, you, you can put Thomas Sowell there and you can advocate for Shelby Steele. Um, any such claims are deeply offensive and reflect a gross misunderstanding of the horrific institution of slavery. 
And then like, you know, and then if you read the curriculum like I did, there's another there's another section that I that I find offensive because it's an African American history course that discusses other forms of slavery in Asia and Africa. Now, I'm like, what this is an African American history course. Why are you putting in slavery around the world? This is not a comparative world slavery course, which is which would be appropriate to discuss the differences in slavery because I'm going to discuss that now and how it affects us constitutionally. Um, but while it's true that forms of slavery have existed around the world throughout history, and I, I always argue this, I'm like, hey, you're right. There's slavery everywhere. I'm like, yeah, you're right. But none was like ours. The scope, brutality, and legacy. Like, unlike many forms of servitude, chattel slavery in America was race-based. No other slavery was race-based. It was hereditary. And it was lifelong and through generations. The commodification of humans as chattel was dehumanizing and marked the beginning of systematic racial inequality in America that has transposed itself into other types of inequality in America. I'm not going to go over the key arguments against the notion of the benefits, benefits of slavery with this group. There's, there, there's cruelty and inhumanity, loss of freedom and self-determination, generational trauma that impacts the impacts of which extend to today. I think this group is well well versed in that. So I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go over that part because I think I'm speaking to the choir and I don't want to speak to the choir. I want to provoke you as I was provoked as well. The racial discrimination and segregation, economic exploitation. And I think we're now, now you're starting to see where I'm going to go. Now you're starting to see how this is making up. How what Florida is doing is a sentiment that is shared throughout all of our diaspora as far as inequality and what they're trying to do to individual rights. The 14th Amendment, let me, let me just make this absolutely clear too. The 14th Amendment is the cornerstone of civil rights in the United States. It was passed after the Civil War during Reconstruction era. And I think, Joseph, you made a great point about the, uh, the compromise of 1877. We have a few of those compromises that we come to know now fuck this all up. But that was a great point. I'm glad you actually emphasized that. I want people to learn more about what Joseph was talking about, the Compromise of 1877 and Rutherford B. Rutherford B. Hayes, because it, start, it ended the Reconstruction era and started the Jim Crow era and black coats. So it's very important what Joseph talked about. And then also what we all talk about every single week with regard to civil rights and how the Supreme Court is even interpreting these things because the way we teach our history is the reason why the Supreme Court is interpreting cases like the case against UN, UNC and Harvard, the way they're doing it. So it's important to make the connections because like, well, let me make it simpler. Let me make it simpler. Affirmative action. Let's, let's look, at, look at affirmative action. How can, how, how do we like, like, you know, white dudes come up to me like, like, how are you talking about affirmative action? And like, you know, how does that, what does that have to do with slavery? Well, distorted perspectives on slavery can undermine the importance and necessity of affirmative action policies designed to redress historical racial in injustices. Because if you, think, if you think slavery was happening everywhere and America was just like it, it was bad, but like, you know, it wasn't as bad as it was everywhere else. Or if you think that there were some benefits that were conferred upon slaves, then it wasn't so bad. It's not a legacy thing. It means that, it, you know, but affirmative action is not a favor to black people. It's not a favor to descendants of enslaved people, but it's a necessary mechanism to counter the, the persistence of the vestiges of slavery. Diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. What views on slavery can also detrimentally affect those things because that, that's what they're going after now. Because this idea, the whitewashing of slavery leads to saying, why do you even need DEI? As a matter of fact, we don't want to, even want to do DEI anymore. These, they exist be, to counteract the systemic racial disparities that slavery in, in Mark, gender. Yes, yeah. you are doing great. Can I just, because uh, you're covering a lot of territory and when you say DEI, that's diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, which is also uh, what the right wing um, dark money and front groups are fighting against. And that is how they bring their... Um, LGBT or don't say gay bill, which is very generic uh, for um, the turning back of many of those rights. So go go ahead, continue, Mark. I'm, I'm here. Sorry, okay. I, uh, sorry uh, to was, interrupt your that flow. Was 
that was X. Yes. Um, I'm sorry so, to interrupt your flow, but we're, you know, when we do, no, no. you know, acronyms and things, I want people to understand and that DEI sure. is also tied to SEL, start understanding that, which is social emotional learning. And that too is something that they are using to take a lot of these books and things out of the school. So go ahead, continue. So here, here's how DEI becomes important so does affirmative action because even after the end of slavery we needed a civil war to stop it the, the country had to go to war with itself to stop slavery they needed a constitutional amendments um to multiply or to 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 build upon that stoppage of treating um africa enslaved formerly enslaved people as chattel and not as human beings they needed supreme court cases and rulings, like including before and after Brown versus Board of Education to underscore the continuous legal struggle to counter systemic racial disparities, which they're trying to erase. It's not the fact that they're trying to erase the history of slavery. They're trying to erase the systemic nature of it. And it's very important that everyone understand that. It's very simple. They don't want it to be systemic. They want it to be in time and ended. So policies such as affirmative action are, that are implemented to redress racial and ethnic discrimination, they, they want to say, hey, it, you know what? We don't have systemic racism because we ended it before. And we're teaching this curriculum to say, hey, there was stuff that benefited black people that like, you know, you don't need reparations because you learned how to be a carpenter when you were a slave. Um, so in, in, in some, despite the efforts of, of of all these, all these efforts to achieve equality, um, we are still struggling to free ourselves from the shackles and manacles of white supremacy and systemic racism. This is this is the this is the root of it right here. The Florida Board of Education. They, I don't care if they have black people that like are part of it. They're, these are the I call them Muppets <laughs> because they're literally Muppets. They're like. They do what they're told. They say what they're told. And like, they, they don't think. And some of them were probably guided by their instruction from um, the UDC. They may have been taught the revisionist history and right. not it, know it, any better. Just look up Kimberly Daniels. She's uh, she's on the task force that created this, this curriculum. She literally, and you can see it. A lot of people have retweeted it. She's on camera saying, I'm glad for, I uh, thank God for slavery because if it wasn't for slavery, I'd be in Africa worshiping, worshiping a tree. First of all, I'd be in Africa. Africa is a continent. Where exactly would you be? Number one. Number two, who worship trees? Uh, so you, you know, you're a black person in America, an African American, trivializing you know, the multitude of. I mean, there's Christians and Muslims and all kind of uh, rel religious people in Africa that don't worship trees. So what are you talking about? I mean, that is like buying into the savage mentality. Um, that white supremacy stokes. Um, so there's there's a need to assert that, you know, th there's this need, there's this continued need to assert that people of color um, are not lesser beings, but equal in all respects is emphasized in our Declaration of Independence, that every individual has a, has certain, un, what, it, what they call them, unalienable rights, underscoring our shared humanity. That's what, That's our goal. That's the more perfect union, that we have a shared humanity, that we have to remain committed to that kind of truth and that everybody is important in their own being. That's why we have these cultural wars going on right now. And that's why the LGBT community is caught up in it. And that's why we're caught up in it, too, because they have to do the whole thing. They can't parse out um, the way that the 14th Amendment works, that equal equal protection works. Um and it's so so it becomes important when you talk about cases about affirmative action and voting rights and all these things. And Katanji Brown Jackson's dissent was talking about what we're talking about with regard to Florida. When she when you read her dissent about the history of discrimination and the examples she uses, we understand that the ongoing controversy over the African American curriculum in Florida, it underscores the critical importance of teaching a truthful history. That's accurate. Even if it makes people uncomfortable, it makes black kids uncomfortable as much as it makes white kids uncomfortable. No black kid wants to hear about their the vestiges of slavery and how they were forced to do the things they were supposed to do and endure as much as a white kid wants to hear that. But not telling a black kid that there was a benefit from that is even more disrespectful and more dehumanizing. And it emphasizes a white supremacist ideology placed upon that black child. 
So it's necessary to have truth in education and continual learning because America needs to learn and relearn over and over and over again, all these lessons time and time again, until the truth can finally set America free. You, they, first and foremost, with all these cases with regard to civil rights and all the things that we're, that we're talking about with regard to human rights. Because now, when I don't even think we're talking about civil rights anymore. We're talking about human beings and human rights that we all have to fight for. We have to acknowledge it all starts with America recognizing that it has to acknowledge the brutal and dehumanizing realities of chattel slavery and not what about is it that's and say, hey, other other countries did it too. Not nah, y'all were the worst. We were the worst. And, yeah. And, 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 and you, what? Yeah. Sorry. you talk about the dehumanizing aspect of it, and that is absolutely um, um, a common thread throughout. It is also a, a, a common thread uh, in fascism because it is uh, slowly um, making um, people into subhumans, then not human at all. And then once you take away um, a people's humanity, um, it makes it okay to do inhumane things to them. Okay? And, and, and to close out, let me close out. Um, so as we seek to become a like I started in the beginning, a more perfect union. Uh, that's always been my guide light in learning the Constitution better than as, as many people as I, I can to know. Um, Got to face the enduring, enduring legacy of, of slavery by acknowledging it and understanding it. Um, everybody, not just Black people. Um, we truly liberate ourselves from the vestiges of, of its, its systemic legacy. Um, and it, it and but at, at the other end of it though, and on our end, on the active end, and the intellectual end, on trying to combat systemic racism, um, it demands our constant vigilance and commitment to uphold the truths stated in our Declaration of Independence. It's ours, even though it wasn't written for us. It's still ours. It reaffirms our shared belief that all people are created equal, with certain unalienable rights. And that every individual is worthy of respect and the dignity of their lives to do what, what they want to do with their lives. That's what God gives every single person in this country by the words that was found, it was founded upon. So our journey towards equality is not merely about righting historical wrongs. So I know that we're ta I'm talking about Florida. I'm talking about the 14th Amendment, but it's not merely just talk. It's about living in this country and then also the country living up to the ideals upon which it was based. And as a nation, that's the only time this nation can come together. And Martin Luther King said it better than I ever could in plenty of speeches, but I just summed it up right there. The nation has to live up to the words upon which it was founded. And I know there's people that don't like the experiment. They don't like that the constitution gave us all these rights. They don't like what's going on with regard to birth rates and, and the fact that like, you know, white kids aren't being born at the same rate of other kids. So they want to do, they want to get rid of uh, women's rights to, for, for their own uh, reproductive uh, health care. Bali autonomy is going to become an issue on the constitution. Right to privacy is going to become an issue. Griswold v. Connecticut is in danger, y'all. That's the right to privacy. That's the penumbra of that's substantive due process. And They've then, already here in Tennessee started taking people's medical records and particularly trans patients. Exactly. And that's a, that's a violation of a right to privacy. So when I when I when I talk about these things and people don't underscore that I'm not just talking about black people. I'm talking about all people because our rights are connected. I'm not I'm not talking about that speech. That's a you know, that's a uh, that's a great speech about they came for uh, the. You know, the, the first the, came for Nehemiah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but, but it means something, though. It happened before. It's, it, it, they, it tries to happen again. It's, it's like a virus. If you don't cure it, it keeps on coming back. Or not cure it. If you don't stop it, it keeps on coming back. It's always going to be around. But, you know, like, like I said, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that I gave a good summary of, uh, uh, and touched upon some things. I didn't go into the law school uh, professorial with y'all. I'm very passionate about this subject because I think it's the root. It's the root of, of what we're seeing 
with regard to how the Supreme Court is judging these things. I think they're they're they are miseducated with regard to the history of our country and the plight of the black American and, and how our civil rights develop. I think that Katanji Brown Jackson's dissent is is illustrated through what Florida is doing. The reason why she made that dissent and she probably didn't even know Florida was doing what it was doing or maybe she did. But it's so profound that you have her dissent in the in the affirmative action case in uh, SFFA versus UNC and Harvard case. Um, and then you have what Florida did and you had Vice President Kamala Harris fly down to Florida and give her fiery speech. And I'm glad she brought the fire because I feel exactly like she does. Because we're not dumb people. We're not making this up. This isn't a fantasy. It's not a game. It's real life. This is not a book. We're not learning this in text. There was no benefit to chattel slavery. People survived it. Just like there would be no benefit to anyone at Aus somebody mentioned Auschwitz camp. If you learned how to sew to survive in Auschwitz and you managed to survive, the fact that you can sew cannot be illustrated as a benefit that was conferred upon you as a prisoner in Auschwitz. They don't even teach that in the Florida curriculum for the Holocaust. But for the blacks, they teach that there was slavery everywhere else and that, you know what? Hey, some people got a benefit. And then let me close out. When you read their when you read their curriculum, half the people they cite as benefiting from slavery, they weren't even slaves when they learned their skill. Booker T. Washington couldn't read when he was eight, when he was a slave. He he developed those skills afterwards when he was free. And the, the people they were quoting as being shoemakers were sailors. Then the sailors were shoemakers. Like, get your facts straight, first of all. Second of all, don't shuck and jive us, man. Don't shuck and jive us. We smarter than that. We ain't this dumb uh, uh, collective of, of ignorant individuals on this other side, whoever they are, that are just going to accept this stuff. And uh, you know what? And we cannot and we can never accept this stuff. We can never go back. We ain't going back. We're not going to do this again. We're going to keep on moving forward. With that, I thank you for the mic, D, and I, I appreciate everybody. I'm sorry I got a little bit passionate, but this do this, not apologize. This is, this is that so passion important. is what I wanted you to bring because it is very important. And I know that this is your area of study and passion. So um, it was the perfect time for you with the perfect amount of, of passion because it's very important. You know, you and I connect there and I want people to understand and connect the dots because, you know, like these things are not happening in a vacuum, they're all connected, you know, and uh, they have been going on for a very, very long time, you know, and I, um, like I said, I, I couldn't wait for you to come because I knew that this was, you know, something that you're very passionate about, something we've had conversations about for a very long time. And unfortunately, we will be continuing to have conversations around them because they are not stopping. And another conversation that we frequently have is um, the um, push toward um, authoritarianism. Like you know, we can say straight up now, fascism. They want to create a fascist state. And I have put some things up in the uh, nest and the jumbotron. I want you guys to please, please um, look at those things and uh, dive into the project 20, uh, 2025, this is their declaration, their manifesto, so to speak, you know, and they, they tend to do this uh, when they're at the height of their backlash campaigns and initiatives during and one, the, one, go ahead. Sorry, no. One last thing about, uh, cause you mentioned, I, I want to make sure I mentioned uh, Alabama. Um, this is the same, in Brown versus Board of Education, they, Brown had to come back. They call it Brown Two. Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas, was 1954. They had to come back in 1955. A lot of people don't know that because the Southern states said we ain't we ain't gonna listen to y'all to the Supreme Court, like Alabama's doing right now. They're just like it. Hey, it, it took ten years after Brown for it to well, actually get enforced. <laughs> well, in 1955, the it was called Brown 2. The Supreme Court had to direct the federal courts to make make them do make them desegregate. 
So that's the same thing is going to have to happen now. But but think about what you're saying. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I apologize. But it, it was very important for me to mention this, too. Uh, no, I forgot no, to mention ahead. it because and it took 10 years. You're right. Uh, it takes some time. But because somebody somebody asked me in some comments uh, before I got on, what what they, what is Vice President Harris going to do about this? I'm like, we're not a mar- monarchy. But what's going to happen, though, is um, the Supreme Court, then they're already doing this once once they actually pass this this uh this violation of the Supreme Court order, they got to go back to the Supreme Court and have the Supreme Court direct the federal courts to mandate that they do it or this or the courts are going to do it for them. And it's going to be a big battle. Um, so we're going to see whether this country is going to stand on this. We're going to see what happens with regard to the uh, separation of powers, whether the judiciary ha- actually has any power, um, because is Alabama just going to say like, fuck you to the Supreme Court. I mean, I, I and and bef- maybe ten years ago, I'd say that's that's stupid to even consider. Now, what's going to happen now? I don't know. The 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 opposition to just mere voting, j- just fair voting, is so intense. That's why everything that we do, whether it's local or federal, it counts constitutionally. And we talked. About, we met on this point, D. I told you about this over a year ago. That this. Like it's it's a long fight, but it, it's a fight that covers a lot of ground. Everybody can fight, even if you're on the board of education. Uh, that's especially where the the battlefield is hot right now. And again, I'm going to mention Steve Bannon. He has actually said, like he has uh, spoken openly about destroying the deep state, basically democracy. He has also openly said and applauded the uh, Moms for Liberty. Keep in mind, I'm, I'm working on a video that I hope to get completed uh, this week, but Moms for Liberty, again, you guys know I can go all day on them. They are not grassroots. And when they were formed, I, I've lost count of how many times Bannon had them on their show, but it was to elevate them because they were speaking to the agenda and the message that um, he wanted them to, that he and, you know, the, the whole right wing agenda. And we're having to continue to fight these fights over and over and over again. So it is going to be interesting. These are interesting times that we live in, but it's n- never been more important. It is why, like, I almost lose my mind. There was a, a tweet going around, it's like, what's your trigger? You know, and it was geared toward, you know, politics and that sort of thing. And I will tell you mine, and most of you know at this point, in that both sides is the same and my vote don't matter. Now, you want to make me, you know, like, I'm going to go off because that is nonsense. You, we have one party seeking to take us to a democracy to invest all power and authority into the president, okay? And one who has an administration uh, who is working to improve, as Mark said, because, you know, people need to get rid of the fallacy like um, that one politician can, you know, just change everything. What they do is they express their desires and um, they try to build a coalition, meaning, you know, a legislator, uh, legislative body um, and, um, you know, with the help of the people uh, who are in agreement with that, uh, giving their approval, um, you know, applauding, um, actually uh, making requests and demands of uh, how they can tweak and improve it and then listening to we the people. There are no both sides about this. These two things are not the same. So with that being said, we do have a couple more speakers. I'm going to go to Black Stem and then um, Dr. Marshall. And I'm so glad Dr. Marshall was able to join us today. Um, I just want to thank Mark for that excellent um, discussion that he just gave us. Um, And I want to add to that from a slightly different lens. Uh, One of the comments that Ron DeSantis made in trying to explain away why um, Florida is doing this is he said, well, some of these people learn skills like blacksmithing as if they had never had those skills before. I want to make sure everybody in this room knows because I've done the history work on this. I look through the lens of technology when it relates to African-Americans. Africans came to this country with blacksmithing skills. That's why some of them were brought. Yes, in 1619. 
They also were brought to this country because, believe it or not, the first Jamestown colonists didn't know how to grow food. The Africans knew how to grow food. So did the Native Americans. Those white colonists starved to death because they didn't understand how to put a seed in the ground, grow it into something that they could then harvest and eat. So the Africans that came to this country were not idiots. And when Ron DeSantis makes these kind of comments, he's, he's ex ignoring all of the skills and talents that these people who were thrown into the bowels of disgusting slave ships brought with them. They brought midwifery with them. How do you think all these babies were born in the colonial world? It wasn't just white women sitting out there popping them in out of their out of their you know whatever. It was black women who learned and brought with them midwifery skills. Especially when America, after Britain said it wouldn't allow any more slaves to be sold, America had to start breeding their own. Who do you think was at the bedside of all these slave women that were delivering? Okay. It wasn't like they, a white man came in there and said, Hey, you know what? I'm going to help you with your Lamas. Okay. It wasn't like that. Same with food. If you look at Netflix, go to Netflix. If you have it, watch the series high on the hog. You'll see yes. that there were people, people, Africans that came to this country George Washington, Martha Washington couldn't even cook her own food. She had her slaves teaching her how to cook her own food for her family. George Washington had bookkeeper, a black slave bookkeeper. How do you think that guy knew how to add one and one and knew it was two? He came here with some knowledge, okay? Um, I could go on and on. So when DeSantis says... These people gained skills through slavery. What I think these people were trying to say is that as a result of many states deciding that black slaves were too smart for their own good, they stopped allowing people to teach them how to read and write. The people were forced into a lower level of skills than what their previous generations had. And so now... They've got to relearn how to do what their what their grandpas and their grandmas knew. So, you know, last thing, in 1790, the U.S. Patent Office opened up. It was flooded with patent submissions by black slaves. Okay? I did the research on this. I wrote a book about it. I know this to be the true. The cotton gin. <laughs> The cotton and gin. Also, in Latimer, mm -hmm. who they quote as learning the skills, and he was never a slave. His parents were, but he wasn't. Uh, Correct. And, also, and, and like, I, I think you need to emphasize that over and over and over again, Black Stem. We were enslaved people. We were not slave. African American history doesn't start in slavery. So why, when you talk about other continents, you're talking about slavery to other continents and not the people that were brought here and what they were like in their continent? Why would That's you talk about African? Your only your only reference to African American history is when they were brought here. But when you talk about other continents, you don't even talk about African explorers that were here with Amerigo Vespucci before Columbus. The Moors. That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> so if I you want to if you want to go back to Asia, <laughs> and you want to go back to Africa, you don't want to talk about history. Talk about our history. Exactly. Making a world history course that's accurate and truthful. Don't start us at slavery. What do you? What agenda do you have? Trying to make these kids feel like their history starts as slaves, and that good old white folks were, you know, avatars, and helped us become skilled and able to talk and read. When they didn't even let us read or write, by the way, they didn't let Booker T. Washington read or write. He had to. He had to carry the books for his his master's children to school, and he had to stop at the school and couldn't read or write. He taught himself after he was free. Don't tell me about Booker T. Washington, man. We <laughs> learned this already. So can, I hope oh, everybody no. that is oh, not, no. <laughs> I hope everybody that is not black can understand now why many of us in the black community are absolutely upset beyond 
control over what the messaging is here. And then the last thing I just want to share, uh, which is an extension also of what Mark said, I don't know if everybody knows, but on July 13th of this year, after the SCOTUS decision, 13 attorney generals, state attorney generals, sent out letters to all the major corporations in the country asking the question, how many black people are you hiring? Because we think you're hiring too many black people and not enough white people. And this is just beyond the pale. And I'm intent, I mean the pun, the pun is intended. Biden is the first president in this country who has demonstrated through actual data that black people can actually get more jobs than whites when you give them the opportunity to uh, uh, equally share their skills. The last two months of this jobs report in this country, black Americans have gotten more jobs than whites and they have been in the professional and healthcare fields. Okay. So now all of a sudden we got 13 state attorneys who say, you know what? SCOTUS says affirmative action is not is not fair to white people so we want to know how many white people you're hiring because we think you're hiring too many black people get out of here just get out of here and then the next thing they say they're going to go after is all of these set asides for all these minority businesses that are trying to get uh contracts through their uh local city and state governments i mean people if you don't see what is happening, and I'm talking to our white counterparts, if you don't see how this is going to hurt every black American that you're sitting in this audience with, I don't know what more we can tell you. I just don't know. Okay. We need you folks to start standing up and saying, hell no, we're not going to allow this to keep going. We're just not going to do it. Black people can only yell so loudly and all of these laws and these people are coming after us. They are intent on muzzling us and returning us to our chattel slavery. We need the rest of you, Native American, white American, Asian American, LGBTQ, women, white women. We need all of you to stand up and say, hell no, we're not going back. And that with that, I land my plane. Well, thank you so much. And it, uh, it was a very good flight. Let me tell you, great information. And you can come, you can fly our friendly advocacy arena skies anytime uh, because it's always wonderful. Girl, you, uh, you, can keep, you can keep on flying, girl. <laughs> I'm telling you, she always <laughs> brings it. And I love it. Just so many things um, that she brought out. Um, and I want to give uh, Dr. Marshall an opportunity to chime in here. And, you know, the guys that, you know, the people that we have here up on the stage, because I feel like this is a very robust conversation. I'm going to, uh, you know, kind of do away with my hands. If um, I, I want you to be respectful, but I think all of you can just chime in here. Let's chat because there is so much. I know that all of us have to share um, on this conversation. So, Dr. Marshall, you're up next. Can you hear me, Dr. Mary? Twitter may be doing its thing again. Um, she may need to to go out and come back in. Um, can you hear me, Dr. Marshall? I'm going to. I'm going to drop her down. Mark, you go ahead. I'm going to drop her down and bring her Can back Can you hear me I now? Think... Yes, yes. I'm not okay, sure if great. I had my mic on. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It happens to all I, of I us. I was trying to. Well, hold on just a second. You still hear okay. me? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Even clearer. I yes. had my earpiece in, but I hadn't turned it on. Sorry about that. Because I was asking, can you? You know, we go through this. <laughs> I was asking, can you hear me? And you're asking, can you hear me? Okay, so um, there isn't a lot of newness that I can add to what Mark and Black Star said. But what I initially raised my hand for was I wanted to amplify some things that Mark said. And again, also, as Mark indicated at the very beginning, this space really isn't the space where we need to define enslavement or slavery, because I think just about everybody in this space 
has that information knows it. Um, but I think I can bring some perspective that's a little bit different from the others. Um, I don't have an issue with uh, announcing my age or anything, but in this particular conversation, I think age is a little bit of a, a, a tweak, if you will. So I just celebrated my 77th birthday. Yay! I'm feeling good. I'm not... I get to celebrate one on Friday, the Leo. Uh, hey. I'm not dancing. <laughs> I mean, I, I've talked forever and ever about dancing because I absolutely love, love, love dancing. But um, I've fallen too many times in the last few years so that if there's anything I'm terrified of, it's falling. Because I, I ended up with a mild concussion the last time I fell. But what I wanted to talk about um, is really, you know, that period when as Mark indicated the second time that the, that board V, I mean, Brown V Board of Education was um, discussed and passed again. That was just when I was starting first grade. And I just, I'm, I'm still working on um, an article where I talk about the benefits to slavery of white people, because they benefited from slavery. We didn't benefit at all. And as Black, is it, yes, Black Star said, um, we came unwillingly, dragged, some of us pr chose to just jump in the ocean with our children rather than have ourselves and our children go through what we already saw was going to happen. But we came with skills. They kidnapped us with skills. We had a language. They mixed us up so that some of us couldn't communicate as well as we might have because we all spoke different dialects of the language from that part of the continent that we were from. We had to learn the European language. They didn't know their own language very well. Um, and they spoke different languages as well, yet they want to put the burden of learning on us. We learned all right. We learned how nasty, how deceptive, how evil, how puritanical, how unreligious they were and still are, even though they profess to be so religious, so, um, you know, worthy and praiseworthy of a, a deity that they claim to call God and that they believe in. But what I wanted to talk about I made some notes so I don't ramble. When Mark was talking about the benefits, yeah, one of the benefits that I got, and some of you may have also received these benefits, because even though I received them in the 1950s, they extended well into the 1970s if you were living and going to school in the South. And that is a new book for me was a torn school book. It was a marked up school book that came from the white school. And yet that was to be my new school book. If that's a benefit of white supremacy and white privilege, it certainly wasn't a benefit of say, slavery because we already had the skills. I went to school on a Saturday, not because I had to, not because the Board of Education forced us to, because our teachers said, if you want to learn more and you're willing to come in, we, I am willing to come in and teach you. And this is after they had to type up from their one copy of a new school book the information that they wanted us to learn. I learned a lot about my history because my grandparents and my great aunts who were still alive at that time knew a lot. We had the Jet magazines, the life, the life, the look, the ebony, the um, ebony um, encyclopedias, different kinds of black encyclopedias. My mom was in New York. Anything that she thought we didn't have and needed that was black, she shipped constantly. If there was a UPS around at the time, they certainly would have known my address without having to think about it. They would have seen my grandmother's name and known immediately where to deliver it to. Um, another point that Mark made 
when he was talking about um, how Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington learned and when they learned. We were always fighting for freedom to learn to read and write. The fact is, there were many, as they called them, clandestine schools in the Bush Harbor. When we were supposed to be out there praising and singing to God, we were doing that. But we had dug holes in the ground where we were having school. We were teaching one another how to read and write based on what we had learned cooking in the kitchen, listen to the master and his mistress, whether she was legal or not, listen, listening to them talk, and mentally, mentally, no tape recorder, no iPhone, no Amazon, no nothing, mentally recording what was being said so that we could take it back to the bush horror in the hole with all of the other enslaved people who could slip away and teach them what we were learning. So we were always learning. When, when blacks in the South, especially in Georgia, fought to establish schools, they didn't just fight to establish schools for black folk. White folks in the state of Georgia got the right to read and began to open schools because black folk opened them first. My church was founded in 1787, and in 1763, they had schools within the church. Morehouse College was founded in the church that I grew up in. It eventually, it was called something else at the time, but it, the name was eventually changed. The Georgia Equal Rights Association, founded in my church. This is during a period when we weren't supposed to be reading, we weren't supposed to be thinking for ourselves. We came from a continent where the different tribes had management skills. They had organization skills. They knew who could do what and how they could do it. The extent to which there was, quote, unquote, slavery, it was not the same as chattel slavery. It was altogether different. It wasn't the serfdom of Europe either. The truth, it's coming out. But I feel, literally, sometimes I feel like I'm back in that first grade classroom where I'm learning that Senator, then later Governor Talmadge, is telling me what I can't do because he's not going to adhere to the Supreme Court order. It's like, you know, when you're growing up, you hear your mother, your father, your grandparents maybe even your great-grandparents, if you're fortunate enough for them to be around, say that you're going to see this one day. You're going to see that you're going to experience what we're experiencing. I thought they were talking about <laughs> cracks, wrinkles, um, arthritis, or as they call it, author. Author was coming. Well, who is author? I, don't, I never met any author. Well... I could probably tell you a whole lot about Arthur, as could some of you in this space, except Arthur has many other different names now. But the point is, I am seeing a lot of what I saw my grandmother go through. I never thought that I would live to be any particular age, because when you're five, six, maybe eight or nine, you just want to turn 16 because you're being told, oh, you can learn to drive at 16. Oh, you can do this at 16. When you turn 16, they say, oh, you have to wait till you're 18. Then, oh, now you have to wait till you're 21. I couldn't wait to vote. But then, because my mom and I had the same name, I go to vote after she has voted and I wasn't allowed to vote because they thought I was trying to break the system, cheat, vote twice. My mom and I ended up having to go, living here in New York, we had to go all the way to Center Street with our ID and swear before a judge that we were two different. You see two different people standing in front of you claiming to be the same person. No, we claim to be ourselves. It's just that we had the exact same name, a great name. <laughs> it took me a while to get there because having my mom's name also meant when the mail came from maybe, you know, people I didn't want my mother to know I was getting little love notes from, she would open it. 
Oh, Mary, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize this was addressed to you. Yes, you did, Mom. You just really wanted to know what your daughter was doing. And thank God she did. Because sometimes little, little notes might have information that even I, the junior in the relationship, didn't want to know. But yet, going back to Mark's comment about what we knew, how we knew it, and when we knew it, white folks in Georgia would not have had schools and been able to separate themselves as quickly as they did had it not been for the fact that we established schools when the missionaries from New York, Pennsylvania, and upstate New York came down to, quote, teach us how to read, they were shocked. There was really very little for them to do because we'd already done it. And this is before the Emancipation Proclamation had been written and acted upon. So we are going through a period where we have to continue not only preaching to the choir, wh whom I'm speaking to right now, but we've got to go and recruit some acolytes and I'm not Catholic, but I think they call them acolytes, but we crew some little, you know, choir boys and choir girls and Girl Scouts who don't want to be Girl Scouts. We don't want to make them Girl Scouts. We don't necessarily want to make them choir girls or choir boys. We just want to help them learn what they are not learning in school. We want to help them learn what's not in their textbooks. We want to help them know, as I watched something last night on 60 Minutes, where they interviewed three young people who said, we're tired of learning about Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Booker T. Washington, Harriet Tubman. We already know about them because we've been learning about them since kindergarten. And these three young people were now entering 10th and 11th grade. They were so happy for, I think, it was the organization that's now called Black Heroes. I think I may have gotten the name correct, but if I didn't, it was started by a black woman, and now it's really huge. You can find it on Twitter. If I can remember the name, I'll put it out there, but even the uh, Library of Congress has partnered with them. So now you can actually log into the Library of Congress in order to get that information on black history, a much larger database than they ever had before. We have to continue putting the information out. When I post information on who was hung and how many people gathered with their picnic baskets to watch, it's not information I really in my soul want to post. Because it's painful, it hurts, it makes me cry. But it's information we need to know. Because when you read past the part that says John Smith was hanged, then, and you read why he was hanged, he went knocking on a door looking for a job that he heard about. And some nosy person sitting across the street decides that, oh, he must be going to wait, rape the white woman who lives there. And so I'm going to report him. He gets arrested. He gets pulled out of jail before he can even have a trial. And he gets hung. I mean, that's not something that any human being who has feelings for another human being wants to read about. You, you don't even want to know that that happened. But it is what happened. And in a digital kind of way, it's still happening. Right now, when the, the Satan is declaring that there are benefits to slavery or to the enslaved because they learn skills that they could use later on. I mean, come on, give me a break. We taught you skills. You're probably able to speak and do what you do now because you learn these skills from depending on what kind of family you came from and the family that they came from and the family before them, somebody suckled at a black woman's breast and you got milk that her children should have gotten. You got sustenance that she should have, that her children should have gotten. You got attention from her that her own children did not get. 
They were waiting but never got. They were blessed if they even got to know who their mom was. Because while she was out in the field, all the children were left with the older women. And the older women did what they could. But in many instances, they themselves were already on their way out of this world as they knew it. And some of us are out on our way out of this current technological AI world, but we still have to try to keep putting the information out. And the last thing I want to comment on is, I think this was Black, nearing your last comment, Black Star, about the July 13th letter from the 13 attorneys general. I remember doing some research in the early 1990s relative to affirmative action because at that time it was just as blatant as it is now that blacks were um, benefiting from affirmative action and it was all about us. It was not. We were not the primary ones benefiting. But what I found interesting in the 1990s is that white men had started to put their applications in, had, to start, had started to declare themselves the minority because it was just about that time that the national statistics had come out with regard to which ethnic groups would be um, the largest in X number of years. And it wasn't white males. It wasn't white females. And so white males decided we are the ones who are being discriminated against. And lawsuits were being filed against, I guess it would be the Department of Labor or whomever um, affirmative action fell under at that time to have um, white males declare that we are the ones who are not being served. We are the ones not benefiting. So this craziness that enslaved and black and enslaved and free people of color benefited from slavery is just a bunch of hogwash. So I never got used to landing my plane. So I just shut up. And that's my last note for today. Thank you for, see, for having me and giving me an opportunity to speak. It's so glad to see all of you. And thank you again for all of your birthday wishes. I'm still going to celebrate until the 31st and probably even beyond. Well, thank you. And I will be joining you in celebration on Friday, my new year. <laughs> So um, thank you again, as always, bringing um, such great information with the uh, perspective of personal history and, and others like only you can. And I am always honored when you come in and, and you're able to do that. And I do have a few more people up um, and uh, we are having some connection problems, but you guys hang in there, hang with us, try to come back. If you lose connection, I'll get you up here. So up next, we've got Mark and then 2K and Pup. Real quickly, um, and thank you, Dr. Marshall. That was, um, I felt like I was in class. And in a history class that is voluntary and you can just sit in and just listen, that you don't have to pay for it. You just, you just listen to like some good stuff. So I, Mark, I really appreciate that. I do that. give exams at the end. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll, make sure I, I'll, I'll make sure. I'll make sure. I'll make sure. I'll make. Hey, I'm, I have a, a semi photographic memory, so I, I, I'm sure I can pass your exam because um, I listened intently to what you were talking about. I, uh, I was hanging on yeah, every he, single word. He's a nerd. I know he would pass. <laughs> he would stay up I, late I'm, studying. I'm, def <laughs> I'm definitely, I'm definitely a nerd. Um, but I, but what you, you made me come back up, and I, I appreciate you, Doctor Marshall, because I want to emphasize what you're talking about, and I want to piggyback off you and say constitutionally that the country's at war with itself. It's, at, it's in a battle with itself because after slavery, they, they fought a civil war for slavery, right? The country fought itself over slavery to free black people. 
Now, whatever way that, like, you know, we can argue what, what Lincoln's, you know, purpose was and everything, it was fought over slavery. I mean, it was the slave states against the non-slave states. But even after that, the first Civil Rights Act in America was in 1866. And, and we, so... If that's the case, and then we passed the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments in 1865, 1868, and 1870. So you'd think we'd be done with this, with this idea, right? So the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, um, we'd be done, including the Act of 1866. The land, these are landmark legislations um, that were necessary to codify the rights of formerly enslaved people and their descendants. Why is there a need for more? But then we needed more. <laughs> we needed more. There was 1898 Plessy versus Ferguson in the Supreme Court. Wrongly decided, separate but equal was okay. That wasn't the spirit of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Any of this country's at war with itself. 1954 Brown versus Board of Education. 60 years after Plessy versus Ferguson overruled it partly, by the way. It didn't overrule the entire. Plessy, by the way, just like just but other there's other like little transactions that occurred. Um, so it didn't completely overrule Plessy. It, it will rule Plessy as far as public accommodations. Then there are other cases were needed to integrate so that black people can eat at Woolworths with white people or a shop at Woolworths with white people and sit at sit at like a, a diner with white people. And, and 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 the commerce clause had to be invoked for black people to be able to eat and drink with white people at a bar. All these things needed to occur, and they're not teaching this in Florida. Anywhere else either. And, and, and it stems from, though, it stems from how they're starting. They're trying to, what they're trying to do. And I, I, I read, the, I, I actually read, I mean, like, D, I'm a nerd. I read the, I, I posted it on my Twitter page because I was reading it. I posted a couple things. There's like little nuggets in there that, Yes, they can argue like, yeah, we're telling the truth. Like it was slavery was back. American child slavery was back. But there's these little nuggets in there about benefits, about other forms of slavery that has nothing to do with African American history. I can, I, you know, I, I've taken a comparative slavery class, and been, I've been very vocal in that class and argue with white folks in that class. This is like 30 years ago, right? Um, and I'm having, and I, I talked to my college buddy like recently. I was like, man, I'm, I'm actually arguing he's like i hear you man he's like Mary, he's like he, he's like i was about to text you we're having these same arguments we had 30 years ago isn't this crazy i'm like no it's not crazy it's not because you know we we always constantly have to we have to have these arguments like i talked about before we have to be vigorous in our engagement on all facets of equal protection civil rights and humanity for all people if you don't think you're the vanguard for all that is is about the the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment and everything this country stands for, then what are you here for? What are you doing in life? It's not just about us. It's about everybody. We started the goddamn thing. And the thing will end, it, it will end on us too. This shit will fall apart. If they, I mean, it will fall apart. United I mean, we stand, divided we fall. But absolutely. I, I, I'm, but I just, I just want to end with this. Look. I talked about Dodd last year. D, you remember. I said, look at the language. Look at the language these justices are using. Look at the language they're using in these cases. I, I, I knew Florida was coming. I knew this stuff was coming because you can see it coming. This, this, <laughs> this is a resurgence of that Southern, like, you know, that, that South idea that, you know, hey, y'all are not supposed to be here. This country was established for us, not you. We made a mistake by bringing you here. Um, Y'all should have been transported back to Africa. Think about that. Think about that. And then, but then at the same time, you think about that. Think about like, hey, you started this country with some words. Those words have meanings. Just like if you call me a nigger, that has a meaning to me. It's going to evoke some, some passion in me and you might get slapped. Well, you probably are going to get slapped. And a lot of things you say on Twitter, you're not going to say to me to my face. But at the same time, because words evoke passion, I read stuff like all men are created equal. 
you guys made it so that all men and women are created equal now. I read stuff like people have unalienable rights that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That you declared your independence by and you still cover your heart, cover your hand over your heart when you hear a declaration of independence that didn't really talk really nice about me, but I still stand for it because I stand for the principles that this country was founded up upon. I'm a veteran. Um, I stand for the national anthem and I cover my heart and I think about what it means to me. Like everybody thinks about what it means to them. Um, I am closing with this. This is our country as much as it's anybody's country. This country would not be respected around the world if it wasn't for black folks that, that made civil rights occur. The first, the, the, the first 10 amendments to the constitution were insufficient. They were unacceptable globally. Think about that. The bill of rights, they fought over that shit for five years. White dudes fell over the bill of rights for five years. They had two constitutional conventions to come up with a bill of rights and, and they split Congress. They split it between a Senate and, and a, a legislature because of the South. Y'all remember that? The constitutional conventions, the great compromise of Missouri to split the, the slave states of new newfound territories, the Louisiana Purchase, all of these things. This all happened amidst uh, slaves being free. But this is what makes us different African-American history it makes us different because, again, like I said before, it was racial. It wasn't just like territorial. It wasn't just wars won. It was racial. It was hereditary. And the vestiges of slavery still linger today. I know they're trying to cut that off because they don't want to pay reparations and they don't want to they won't want to they don't want to feel bad. Well, shit, I feel bad to this day right now that my great grandmother it was not as free as I am right now. That makes me feel bad. And it makes me feel bad that Florida wants to teach a history to my young brothers and sisters that is not accurate. That portrays them as like, you know, hey, you started as property and you, oh my God, look what you've done with yourself. Amazing things you've done to come from slavery. And we helped you do it. It's like, I don't want, that's why I didn't watch the movie Avatar. I can't stand that fucking movie. Anyway, thank you, D. Um, I, I'm like, I'm like, uh, Dr. Marshall, I don't want to land my plan. I just want to stop. Well, <laughs> like I said, you guys don't have to go anywhere. That's kind of what I do. Um, I I'm done for now. So you guys don't have to go anywhere. If you want to chime back in, feel free to do so. Up next, we have at the mic, uh, 2K and then Pup. So glad both of you are here today. Haven't heard from, uh, either of you in a while. So good to have you in the conversation. You're next, uh, 2K and then Pup to go over territory that people have already, uh, um, messages that people have already offered. But I want to uh, take up something, and I apologize. I don't remember. I didn't catch who said it. Um, a couple of speakers ago, someone said, was talking directly to uh, allies, and I'm going to craft my message for allies and uh uh, I'll just white women in particular and um, anyone who cares to build on this, frankly, you know, um, this what this willful ignorance that is starting with the notion of of uh, the, quote, benefits of slavery and quote, is obviously a ripple in the pond. So think about it isn't simply me as a black woman uh, being concerned about learning about the fullness of the history of these United States. It's not my history. It is the history of these United States. I'm also concerned about, think about what everyone is being deprived of. Right? You're being deprived of a full understanding. You're being deprived of an opportunity for being the fullest human being that you can be. You're being deprived of critical thinking skills you're even being deprived and cheated of the from the opportunity to think that you as a white person could be better than the white people who came before you you're getting cheated so it isn't just about us and then 
I'm going to cut to this. Make no mistake, as people have alluded to, they're coming for all of us. They're thro- they're um, sowing seeds of chaos, division, throwing sand, uh, getting us to doubt ourselves in our, that, that's their attempt, at least, in our unity. And I don't know if you, I was, I was shocked. This is apparently an old plan, but I saw it on Twitter this weekend. Uh, there's some, you know, how there are some things that are apocryphal. I don't know, but it's scary enough. And these people are nuts enough that I can believe it. There was some plan that uh, MAGA type right wing males had a plan to, uh, I, I hate to even say this, to, to rape white women in conjunction with the lack of freedoms uh, for uh, health care and, and birth control and controlling your bodies so that you can be pumping out white babies. They're coming for all of us. Look it up. I'm not making this up. If I'm, if I'm making it, what I'm doing is repeating what I, what I read. It's uh, present on Twitter. So think about that image barefoot and pregnant if you're a white woman if you know a white woman if you know anyone of childbearing age i mean in in my community i'm very concerned because frankly the way i see it is uh, our maternal health rates are so poor that if if we have if we're forced to to carry children then you know we can just fall to the wayside but there is a project, an idea, a fear in them to create more white people. So on two, let me knit these two things together. So being, if you're deprived of education and the ability to think critically and the ability to um, also benefit from affirmative action, because we do know the figures are that People who benefited most from affirmative action were white women. Uh, so if you're being deprived of that, I can see. So dragging back to all of these things that might sound ridiculous, <laughs> be, dragging back to there are people out there talking about women shouldn't have the right to vote. They are coming for all of us. So it isn't simply a matter of... TK, uh, you, you're making a good point. And... Um, I just want to throw in here while you're doing that, that um, I, I've talked a lot about and shared information about um, the work of the UDC in, in the field of education. But keep in mind, some of their most prominent members, they had an agenda, but they, too, wanted to stop the progress of women in certain ways. They bought into the patriarchy and they helped to um, amplify and solidify it. They were actually against um, the vote (laughs) um, for women. And uh, there was a, again, another massive push during the massive resistance, which is largely made up of white women who were uh, stoking Republican politicians to not ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. So, yeah, some of them Precisely. fight against themselves. <laughs> Precisely. So I'm calling, We, if, if you're in this room, I have no doubt that you're an ally or you're interested in allyship, which is a verb. And we are all in this together and we all work for each other, regardless of how we identify or who we are. So I appreciate that. And the last thing I want to do is make a big plug for with this idea of reducing education and lying about slavery and depriving all of us of the richness of our history and how we can grow together. I'll then wrap, button it up with this. The numbers are there. Diversity, which is a well-worn term and, and laden, but I think you'll all give me grace in using it. Diversity, it's clear. The numbers are there. In terms of what's in it for me, it's how we make a buck. It makes money. There are um, figures that show that any business uh, earns, there's more of a return on investment when your investment is in every single one of us and how we are fully ourselves in these United States. And with that, I will end I will end my my rant. What is it? Land my plane. Thank you. 
Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, Pup um, is is up next. And I just want to chime in a bit on a couple of things she said uh, before you speak, Pup. Um, to, you know, yes, um, to drill down on the coalition building, I am so glad that you mentioned that. It is the reason I put it in the thread. It's on my timeline. Please, please watch and share uh, Freedom Summer. That is all about coalition building. We would not have had the success that we had without the coalition of young white students all over this country, young college students, which also, uh, when I rewatched it and uh, just reminded myself of it, it made me think, and I, and I told someone this, this is why they know how successful that was uh, and with the um, TV becoming popular then and seeing these young white people and having them um, experience life because they lived in the community. And um, so they really got a, a very different perspective and it was not easy but it was necessary and it was important. So I, I want to, you know, tip my hat to those in the early days who were willing to be part of that coalition on the front line. And as 2K said, encourage others to come into the coalition because we need each other. Uh, as Mark has alluded to in all of the things that he said, you know, this democracy works because of all of us. If any one of us, is denied rights and freedoms. Um, the rights and freedoms of the others are in jeopardy. So thank you so very much uh, to Kay for bringing up um, an important topic. And like I said, something that I do want us to, to understand and keep going back to. And please, like I said, look at that Freedom Summer. It's also another reason I shared it is because we're talking about education and schools. Because, and Dr. Marshall talked about this, how black schools were initially formed after the Civil War. And this is part of the backlash and, and why they hated it as well, because as she said, black people were forming schools and they did not like them being educated. And um, also during Freedom Summer, one of the things, because they were still having problems with black people getting educated, they had freedom schools, okay? And some of these people had never you know, known or been introduced to the type of learning, uh, the type of history that um, they were able to get introduced to by these um, students over the summer. And with the push, their active push, uh, I play it again and share it because this is, we may have to reinstitute something like Freedom Summers. In a way, I feel like our weekly session here is our own little weekly um, Freedom School to help to educate people. It is very, very necessary. And then I also posted to the quote that I had shared with you um, before from the Monuments Men. You know, you take away uh, people's history and it's like they didn't exist. So, you know, you take away their history, their art, their contributions, and it's like they want to erase us. This is not um, hyperbole or being hyperbolic. It's true. They've said it and they're do they're working to do it. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Pup and we'll continue. Hey, D. Long hey, time. how you doing? I know. How are you? Pretty good, and I really just want to say I miss hearing your voice. I, I don't know what oh, it thank is. thank you, but... man. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I wanted to comment on is uh, a few speakers ago, and I apologize because I'm driving and I can't, can't pay attention to the screen, so I don't know who the hell it was, but she made the comment that uh, there are more blacks getting hired than whites. This, to be quite frank, doesn't surprise me for predominantly two reasons. The first reason is, and there's also a third contributing reason, and I'll cover that at the end. The first reason is, uh, you know, and after spending 40 some years in corporate America, is in the technical trades, you, you hire the best people period. You hire the best qualified, the best educated, the best experienced. 
right? So, uh, and the second thing is, is after the last census, the Census Bureau reported that uh, uh, whites are a decreasing majority and that by 2040 or 2045, they are going, uh, the United States is going to be much more homogenous from an ethnic and racial standpoint. So you combine those two together, and it really doesn't doesn't surprise me at all that to find out that there are more blacks getting hired than whites. Um, and the second, the third thing that's a corollary, at least in my mind, and this is an anecdotal observation over probably fifty years, is that blacks tend to want to become better educated for a whole plethora of reasons, you know, to make more money, to get a higher station in life, I mean, whatever. But most of the people that I've known that have been black really want to continue learning. And a lot of what I've experienced, again, this is an anecdotal observation, is uh, the white community gets to a point, they get comfortable, and it's like, okay, I'm done. I don't need to learn anything more. I'm making enough money. I, you know, I've got a nice car, blah, 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 blah. And I'm done with this education thing. I, you know, almost every black person that I've ever known spoken to, they always have the desire to continue to better themselves and educate themselves further. And I might conclude this by saying, learn a fucking trade. What kind of crapola are you talking about? I, it, it, it just, it doesn't jive with history. It doesn't jive, you know, it, it, it's just, and I think Mark is right. They're just trying to make themselves feel better. Um, and before I land my plane, one other more point. As the United States becomes more homogenous and whites start to lose their white privilege because they, you know, they don't have enough people to vote. They don't have the, you know, blah, blah, blah. You're going to see this get a lot worse. That's my prediction. I, I hope the fuck I'm wrong. But, you know, I when you have a group that has had just ultimate privilege for literally hundreds of years, and you start to take that away from them, uh, they're going to fight back. They're going to well, fight back. I mean, and they're showing us this. They, they've always done it. This, again, speaks to the backlash of it all. And, and it's getting ramped up because um, the time for them uh, becoming a minority is getting closer. So they are doing yep. everything that they can to maintain power as a minority. Apartheid. Yep. Hello, fe uh, people. And they pretty much told us that this is their plan because they're right. They're the ones who should have um, the ability to govern and to um, control the direction of our country and the environment of our country. And they are not stopping. And if anything, they are just figuring out more ways um, to to go about achieving it. You know, it's death by a thousand cuts from a, def, uh, a thousand different directions. The, the education leg is one way that they're getting us on democracy. They are uh, certainly getting us on, on voting rights and with you know, voter suppression, exactly um, everything. Because ultimately, you know, when you're in an authoritarian, you know, fascist dictator, you know, ship, um, then you know, people really don't matter um, in any real way. You know, only as to how they can further your agenda, and they become very um, disposable. And, yeah, and, and. You know what pisses me off the most about this? Everything, I, I, 100%, I, I wish I could hit the 100% button. But the thing that pisses me off the most about this is they have told us what they're going to do. And, I mean, it's kind of like if you get stabbed, you don't see it coming. Okay, 
I wasn't paying attention. I can blame it on me. But it's entirely different. If somebody walks up to you, looks in your face, and says, I'm going to stab you, and then runs a fucking broadsword through you. I mean, it's just... It's just... They're, I mean, they're not I, being secret about it, so we we cannot um, gloss over it. We cannot ignore it. We cannot laugh at it because they're very serious. And and every time we hear about, read about, talk about a law like the one they passed in Florida and other places, this is just further evidence of them uh, carrying out their agenda post haste. Like they, yeah. they recognize the speed at which they have to work this next election. I mean, I know we said this in the last one, but and, and it was true then. It's even more true now. Whether Absolutely. or not we remain a democracy, everything hangs on this election. Everything. Because now, I mean, they were intimating in ways big and small, but they have flat out said it. They have basically uh, posted their manifesto to do just that. And as, um, you know, Maya Angelou says, when people tell you who they are, we need to believe them. We need to proceed accordingly. And we need a coalition. That This is no time for us to get um, lost in, in frivolous arguments and battles because you can believe that, um, you know, Places like this are going to be more fraught with that kind of behavior and um, X is going to be making it harder and harder for us to come together, to speak our truth, to strategize. We have to start it now. We have to be strong um, in our defense of democracy because they are absolutely, it is not just about them having a little power. They want total power and they have told us what they intend to do with it and it is not to uh, perfect the democracy it is in fact to do away with it because it is no longer serving their purpose and, and d i think it's important to to understand that the reason why we are a world power is because of our democracy and the diversity that we have within it and because of all of our the sum the sum of our value is greater than our individual contributions so absolutely that that is the the the, the whole essence of the united states of america con running the world is because of diversity absolutely correct a hundred percent it I, is and I, I, it just i just wanted to voice that I, i'm really pissed off that they have the audacity to tell us how they're going to fuck us in advance and then start to follow through on it. And, and just, uh, and that in and, in and of itself is a form of privilege. I have the it privilege really to tell <laughs> I have the privilege to tell you how I'm going to bend you over a chair and I won't finish that. <laughs> um, yeah. It, it just, but it is. And regarding diversity, Oh, my God. Yeah. I, you know, if Russia, which is all Russian, was such a great idea, then guess what? They'd be kicking our ass. They'd be kicking Ukraine's ass. But they aren't. It's the diversity. Uh, and I, I got to land my plane and turn my mic off or I'm going to start yelling into the car. <laughs> Thanks, Clef. I appreciate it. I hope you keep listening. Uh, go ahead. Who is that chiming in? Hi, this is TK. I wanted to piggyback okay, on the diversity. Diversity. I just want to say one thing about um, the idea. People are always, or frequently, we hear that people get excited about quote innovation. And one of the things with diversity, um, because you have all kinds of, if you have everyone bringing their perspective to the table, you get a range of ideas, and that's one part of innovation. But you know what the second part of it is that pe that is overlooked? It's about building community you can generate a lot of ideas a lot of things but for, to be able to sustain new ideas you need community buy it that's people that's human beings and nothing runs that communication better or supports that more than when you have everyone excited about things and taking things back to their communities and what have you and and talking about so that's another part of you know so when you want to to grow expand and i'm going and 
make money, all of that stuff that people think is so good, it comes with diversity. These people don't want to share. They're narrow-minded, short-sighted, and will kill us all if we let them. So, D, as you said, they're coming for us. And at the very least, you know, Mother Nature isn't having it anymore. So we need to all be together to be about something. Pass. Thank you so much. Absolutely, we do, because uh, that's another, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, uh, climate change. Like, um, again, dark money here, folks. Uh, the Koch machine and, and the other organization, the Heritage Foundation, is the one publishing their um, dystopian um authoritarian agenda and manifesto and um just keep in mind i i put it up there in the chart but the heritage foundation alec and um the um the um council for national policy these folks are very um much involved um in what you're seeing now uh, some of them um directly um, involved and some of them indirectly because of their um, the the groups that they're funded and um, I'm trying to bring Allie up I, I'm so glad she's here Joseph I know is already up um, and um, he has his hand up and Mark is here still so if you guys have any questions um, he is sticking around um, to um, answer questions that anyone may have or if if someone wants to you know chime in further on the conversation or as you know this is also a, a source of news for us anything that is percolating that we haven't talked about that uh, we haven't mentioned we're also um, always glad to have you bring that to our attention so Joseph you're up next and I'm gonna see uh, hopefully Allie will come back up and um, I see Geechee uh, our brain <laughs> our brains rust coming up so um, looking forward to having you uh, guys here um, and joining the conversation today so Joseph and then Allie, we have her, and if we can get Geechee up, um, he'll be next. Thank you, Ms. D. Um, wow, it has been just such uh, an enriching conversation for me um, to learn, you know, things that I hadn't learned um, before. And kind of like, uh, I believe it was 2K that was saying, is that, you know, when we're not being taught the whole story, I mean, you feel shortchanged. Because it's like, how am I supposed to be a better person if I'm not being taught the things that can make me a better person, that can enrich, uh, that can enrich my mind, you know, and enrich my perspective? Um, you know, we're talking about the uh, the skills um, that uh, you know DeSantis is trying to claim that slaves learn through slavery. It's like, no, no, because I I remember, I want to say I was in seventh grade. And the Hang social on, Allie, check your mic, dear. Go ahead and con Joseph. I keep okay. hearing a little bit. Okay. Of background noise. Okay. Um, I, I want to say I was in seventh grade, and uh, my social studies book uh, talked about you know various civilizations from all parts of the world, and I remember learning about a couple of civilizations in Africa. I want to say one was a in around the area that's today is Mali. And then the other was in the area that's now today, Tanzania. And, uh, you know, basically how, how advanced these, uh, these civilizations were. So for someone like DeSantis to say that the slaves learned these skills through slavery, it, it's frankly, it's insulting. Um, because of the fact that all the civilizations in Africa that were 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 flourishing, uh, much like uh, you know here in North America, especially here in the West Coast and throughout what is now you know most of Latin America, the civilizations that were thriving here before the Europeans. I mean, the Aztecs, the Mayas. The Incas, I mean, you know, th there was a whole world that was going on outside uh, of Europe. And I, 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 I'm trying to take this conversation and maybe tweak it to how I would need to uh, inform somebody, maybe from here from California or here in the West, about how, like, say, for example, 
you know, here in, in California, how the missions, how, you know, they were built on the backs of basically slave labor from the indigenous uh, uh, people of California. You know, the Spaniards came and basically enslaved our, you know, our, our indigenous population. And, uh, you know, having gone to Catholic school for both elementary school and high school, you know, especially early on in elementary school, we got a rather rose colored uh, uh, view of how the missions were built. Um, but fortunately uh, later on, you know, I, you know, learned the real truth. And actually I think I was still in elementary school because my, uh, my fifth grade teacher uh, was native uh, Native American from one of the tribes here in Southern California that uh, was in a way connected to the, one of the missions that was built in the LA area. So we kind of, you know, we learned the other side of the story. We frank frankly learned the truth about the uh, about the missions. So uh, they're not going to people like DeSantis are not going to stop with just with what they're doing right now they are going to try to whitewash every single aspect of american history that portrays people like them in a native in a negative light i mean because let, let's let's be let's be honest about that because um there's a lot of things as we know that happened in our history that uh you know are very unpleasant that you know different marginalized groups in our history have experienced a large degree of unpleasantness. I mean, the, we, we can make a long list. And so, um, so they're not going to stop and we've got to, we, we've got to find some way to put a stop to this. Um, because I'm, I'm very surprised that I haven't heard more here in California about school districts trying to whitewash our own history as far as how we were, uh, how we were developed. Um, just uh, th there's a school board uh, that uh, tried to uh, um, ban teaching about Harvey Milk and how important he was to our state and the LGBT community of our state. And uh, basically, our governor is is going to I think he's trying something that bas basically to override them. Um it's because interesting, Joseph, that you mentioned that because I found a Turning Point reporter who was, you know, in the midst of one of these arguments about it. And, you know, they take um, excerpts and things and they really twist it. They make them extreme and uh, egregious. But um, it's just another opportunity. Like I said, uh, Turning Point USA is very active in this culture war fight. In fact, they have said it, and then this is how they're censoring it. So um, this is where we really do need to talk about this, because unfortunately, I saw quite a few black faces more than I wanted to in there and some speaking. And this, again, speaks to how um, people uh, they can go into people and appeal to their religious ideology and then uh, their poor um you know, education um, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, history education and um, getting people on board that ultimately uh, when the agenda is fully realized, they will be hurt. <laughs> OK, so uh, continue on. I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you, but when you you mentioned that I, I was trying to I was speaking to someone about it and I couldn't remember what it was about who they what they were coalescing and, and fighting about but it was the harvey milk book because i was like you know harvey milk's been dead for i don't know how long what are they screaming about him for and it was because of this book so continue just yeah and it, it you know and and like you said earlier in the space i mean it's it's part of the overall assault on on education and uh uh, a few months ago, I was having a, a discussion with one of my mutuals about how, because we were talking about uh, uh, Asia Pacific affairs, and I said, you know, to be honest, I, I said this uh, this Republican assault on education reminds me very much of what the Khmer Rouge did in Cambodia after they took over. I mean, they 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 basically killed all intellectuals anybody that had to do with 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 education was was killed and 
Um, and as you've mentioned many times, uh, Ms. D, about the, you know, the death by a thousand cuts, this, you know, they are, they've been chipping away at our public education system ever since, uh, ever since Reagan was in office. And what we're seeing now is we're seeing the fruits of, you know, people who were kids during that time. I mean, because I'm of the same, I'm of the same era. I'm an uh, 80s child. And uh, now the people that were, you know, were in public education when that assault started, their minds have been poisoned. And now we're seeing the decisions that that they're making, you know, because of the fact that they were not properly, properly educated. And it's scary. Um, the fact how we've basically seen ignorance being rewarded in the Republican Party. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's terrifying. Somebody for myself that always saw the value of education, and I'm going to, you know, I, I, you know, I definitely was a geek in, in school. Uh, seeing this now, it's, it's terrifying and it's, it's sad. Um, but we can't give up because there's no alternative. I mean, we're not, I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to roll over and play dead and let these people take my rights and the rights of, of others, you know, who I, who I care about. I mean, when we say liberty and justice for all, that means liberty and justice for all, for every single person that is in this country. So, right. Uh, and, and, and I'm glad you're saying that Joseph, because that is the attitude that we must all must have, because those students during freedom summer, if they didn't really have um, the heart to be committed to those um, rights for everyone when, I mean, one of them, her husband um, was murdered and she was still in the fight. <laughs> and then after that, she is the one who encouraged everyone, write your senators. She went to uh, President Johnson. In fact, he, he wasn't non too thrilled with her tone with him, but she, her husband had been killed by racist. So um, we all have to be that committed because really, it is that serious now, okay? <laughs> it is, it, they have brought us back here. I mean, they have um, it stoked violence. They have encouraged it, and rewarded it. So um, they have people primed for this. So we will, you know, see some of these things and it could get very ugly in our country, but we've been in ugly places before, but it is not ever going to be a reason or excuse to sit down, lay down or sit it out. Like now more than ever, we have to fight. And how you do that is is really up to you. But we all must fight. Okay. Um, so I appreciate you saying that, Joseph. Yes. Th thank you, Mr. Yeah, because I mean, uh, I was talking last night with uh, with one of my mutuals and uh, he just expressed a little bit of concern for me about, you know, if I'm like burning myself I, burning myself out on this app, I said, but you know what? I said, I've got no choice. I mean, I've got a lot to lose. I mean, just pretty much, I, 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 I think everybody in this room has, uh, has a lot to, to lose. And so, I mean, I'm just going to use my voice as long as this app is functioning, um, to get the message out there and, and hope that it reaches somebody that, you know, maybe, you know, needs a little bit of more, more information so um i'm gonna land my plane there because i have to uh i have an appointment in a little bit but i'm gonna hang on as long as i can so thank you so much miss d it's been a wonderful space today so so enlightening well thank you so much uh, i appreciate it so stick around for as long as you can um i am gonna you know uh, start to um go into our our wrap-up phase but i can stay here for you know another hour until um you know other people have had an opportunity to speak if they would like and you know if, if we don't have that many speakers i feel like we have you know shared a wealth of knowledge and and information today but we um have geechee I'm hoping Allie can come back and Carrie was up. I know Twitter, you know, X is doing the most <laughs> today. So uh, don't get discouraged, guys. If you are able to, please do. If you want to share, please do come back up. I want to hear from you and I can't wait uh, to hear from our friend Geechee. So how are you this afternoon? 
I'm good. I'm glad you and Soul Sister are doing well today. Hey to both of y'all. Uh, I'm going to be really, really, really brief. I just want um, everyone to pray for the people of Israel, um, and especially our friends that are Jewish that are in this community and in this sect. They're getting attacked from the far left and the far right today um, for standing up for what is right. They're the people that um, stood up when um, Bibi was awful to Ethiopian and other um non-white um, Jews, they were very um, forceful towards that, and they are very forceful in wanting the rule of law to exist in Israel and for it not to slide into authoritarianism or into white supremacy. And, of course, they're getting attacked from the people that don't believe that Israel should be a state, and they're being attacked from the people that think that fascism is good. So um, just pray for them, pray for their strength, and also pray for the protesters that are on the ground that are being water hosed and run over by vehicles and things of that sort. Um, just pray for those people and hopefully the best comes for those people and the people of Israel in a democratic way and not an authoritarian way. And that's all I have for today. Thank y'all for doing this. I've been listening. This has been a wonderful space as always. And I'm going to go back to listening. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for bringing that to our attention, because, yes, I have been watching some of that, too. And it's very important. And it's also a great example of a leader who is under indictment and um, managed to squeak out a win and is now trying to destroy the uh, Supreme Court that could possibly hold him to account. So, you know, take a look at that. Uh, these guys are learning uh, from one another, um, you know, and um you know, he was brought over to speak in the the uh, House when the GOP was in charge as um, and Victor Orban is another one of their fans. So they are taking notes from these people. So thank you so much for bringing that into the conversation, Geechee. It is very important. And again, as I said, uh, we have to keep our um, eyes on what's happening geopolitically because it does in some ways have direct uh, effects on us and sometimes indirect. Uh, but we we're all at, at this point, we are a global society. So uh, we really do um, need to pay attention and be aware of those things that are happening, around, um, you know, globally and and how they come back um, to affect us in some way um, as well. So thanks again. Uh, Carrie is back up. I think her connection is strong. I'm going to give it to her and then Igbon Amali. And I'm hoping Allie will be able to come up because, again, I always love hearing from my friend Allie, bringing that geopolitical uh, perspective as well as just, you know, hitting on some really uh, strident uh, points in our conversation always. So, Carrie, how are you today? Oh, I am so great. I just got back from Minnesota where I was born and raised and paddleboarded a lot and walked in the woods and it was fantastic so i'm back and overwhelmed <laughs> but but i'm good and so glad to hear all of you thanks again for the space and um i had to go in and out a couple times all the way out in fact i rebooted my phone and put my vpn on and all to get back in in case um in case uh, anyone's listening that's having a hard time, just uh, be persistent. <laughs> um, and just to say that, yep, I um, I hear the call. I mean, this is why I'm in the fight and engaged, and I need to do better with time management overall and balance. But even though my sister worries about me um, for uh, being so involved when there's so much going on, I just have to and I tell her that I'm doing it for her too because it's just gets so overwhelming for her she gets just utterly depressed and in despair and I told her not to despair that I have an amazing community where we're getting things done and I'll let her know the little things that she could do of course she always votes and and we'll do this together so um we'll keep up the good fight don't forget about self-care and uh thank you again well, thank you. And another great reminder, Carrie, and I appreciate that. And we appreciate you being in the fight and being part of our community and our coalition and, you know, helping uh, to keep others in your community who may not be as politically engaged, um, but keeping them informed and helping to reassure them. And, and that's what we all must do. Not everyone is going to be actively involved on Twitter or doing other things. But, uh, you know, as I said, again, we all have to be involved in the very, very least that we can do all do is vote. 
Uh, but in addition to voting, we need to ensure that we help other people um, secure their ability to vote and help them to understand the importance of their vote. Uh, we need every single one uh, because they are being very, very persistent in taking our votes away. So persistent that they've decided to just ignore a Supreme Court ruling so this is how serious they are about keeping us from voting. So things like this, knowing people died for uh, um, for trying to exercise that right, knowing that all of the violence around Freedom Summer was simply around people being able to exercise their right to vote. I have no patience for anyone, you know, talking about not voting or wasting their vote, you know, write-ins. I mean, it... it there comes a time that you have to take a stand. This is the time. This is not, you know, we cannot afford any both sidesism at this point. You're either on the side of democracy or autocracy. There is no in between on that line. And it is clear that the Republican Party has chosen autocracy. If you're with them, that's what you've chosen too. If you're sitting it out, you choose it by default. And we need everyone to get on the side of democracy, not just for yourself, but for everyone. Because these things that are going on, these hot topic uh, cultural issues that are coming up, they may not affect you or your life in the least. That's today. Trust me, they will. Because once they're able to take away the rights of any community, it gives them more fuel to be able to take the rights away of others. And eventually, they'll get to your community. Hello, white women. I know that most of you in this space understand that. And I appreciate those of you who try to gather your cousins and your sisters and explain that to them. I was also very heartened this weekend, thanks to our friend Shantae, uh, because she's always dragging a uh, political girl. But uh, she seems to be waking up and making some good messages. I hope she keeps it up. We need everyone. We are not an island. We cannot be alone in this fight. We need a coalition, a coalition, a, you know, a rainbow coalition of people who want democracy to work in this country. So with that being said, thank you so much, Carrie. I appreciate that. Uh, and glad you were able to get your connection. Uh, I'm hoping Allie will be able to do the same. And until then, we have another new voice in um, the space today. And we've heard from him before. I'm looking forward to hearing from Iqbal Namali. So you're up next, sir. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi hey, there. Dee, hey, Dee. Hey, so sister. Dr. Marsha, as always, thank you. Hey, Carrie. Hey, Mr. Mark, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's such a wonderful thing that, you know, these people have chosen times like this to show out that they are their ancestors. Um, there's a saying where I come from, meaning the crop, when it creeps until it produces, you cannot tell which, of the, which melon it is it could be a honeydew it could be a different class of watermelon but until it produces so which means ancestry is everything my people will always tell you go know the story of their ancestors so you know what they would do and it's so clear cut that these people have consistently been their ancestors the beautiful thing is we have come from a long line of victorious powerful people is a is a wonderful thing that right now we have all these multiple tools to tell them and we have all been so adept and very very vast in using their anglo-saxon language of english to really get to what they are saying there's no code word there's no trick they can pull over our eyes anymore and we're not just at this phase where we'll have to wait for three weeks before the print media will tell us the news that happened thank god for great women like Ida B. Wells who did all the investigations but today in every space of our phones uh, our spaces social media spaces everywhere we are we are all the many Ida B. Wells and we will fight them 
until they go out of business. The thing is, even when they want to talk about all the bullshit, which they always do, blacksmithing and copper smithing, as well as silver smithing, all the kind of smithing has been going on prior the invasion of white people and the transatlantic human trafficking that they did. In fact, my um, my one of my parents, who is the historian, his dissertation was on this same history of blacksmithing from University of Ibadan, one of the oldest universities from colonial times into the, the new Nigeria after colonialism. So when, they, when he mentioned blacksmith, I'm like, heck no. That was crazy. But the beautiful thing is we're at this point where we can all speak up. They are afraid of us. Their fear is they know quite well what their ancestors did. The only thing they want to do is to try, walk around it. But no, we are the winning people in this race. Let's all get on all our toes and don't sleep on them. They know we are onto them and they know we know the truth now. And we are on the winning side. We're on the victorious side. The beautiful thing about being black is waking up conscious that you know that you know that you're powerful, that you know that you know you will always meet people who don't like you, but you have all the world with all from the spirits of your ancestors to knowledge that we have now and avenues like this to speak up and get our voices heard that we are victorious. So it's a clarion call to every black person and to all the black conservatives who think what they want to conserve is white supremacy, you will always lose. As much as we address the white women, who have given a large chunk of their vote to sustain a system that is very destructive to others and themselves consequently, we need to start calling our black conservatives themselves, signing on to something that is going to die is not going to work for you. And to every black conservative, I want to ask you, what exactly are you conserving? What exactly? Because I run into people, oh, I'm a black conservative, oh, I'm a social conservative, or I don't believe in this liberalism and all that. No, there's nothing you're conserving other than white patriarchy and white supremacy. That's all. That's all. All. There's nothing conservative about the world itself. So whatever you conserve as a black conservative is just white supremacy. And to all of us, or some people who look like black people who look like us ourselves going into spaces trying to shift for these people they will lose and for anybody who believes that this is america yes we have always been victorious if people knew exactly what our ancestors went through to be in a space and still have offsprings like us speaking offsprings like dr march speaking dr march speaking that tells you something that you can never you can never annihilate us either historically you can never annihilate us in any way so we are on the winning side and we will chase them crazy bullets out of town like bob nester Mali said Thank you, everybody. Oh, I love that. And I love Bob Marley. So thank you so much. And I appreciate you coming and, you know, sharing your unique perspective, um, that of your ancestors. It means a lot um, for you, you know, to, to share that here in the space um, very uh, appropriately. So uh, today and yeah, we're not going anywhere. And, you know, our greatness, uh, we know it. Um, and we will continue to tout it. And it is because of us and our continued efforts that this country will continue to survive, improve, and be great. Uh, so thank you again. Um, I've got Dr. Marshall who has her hand up. And as I said, I'm going to start winding down. So Dr. Marshall, um, you're up next. Um, just a quick comment. I forgot to mention to the rest of the space, I retweeted Mark's essay from Medium. So if you haven't read it, Mark wrote an excellent essay on We're Not Going Back. That's not the title. Forgive me, Mark. I know it was similar. I just wanted to point out it was really an excellent essay. And everybody should download the Medium app. It's free. You can always delete it after you read Mark's essay. We love Mark and we love his analysis. So... Just wanted to plug that. 
Thank you so much. I forgot that I did. It is in um, it's in the thread of the the space. If it's not in the the nest, it is in the thread, and it's certainly on my timeline. And ditto to what you said. It was beautifully written and um, very good. So thank you um, for um, mentioning that, Dr. Marshall. I, as I said, sometimes. Uh, my head is spinning with so much information. Uh, I forget things and I appreciate and I count on you guys to help me remember and help bring important facts uh, to our community. So thank you so much for that. And we certainly love Mark for, you know, his contributions always here in the space. But, you know, this written essay is also another great contribution that we do need to amplify and share. And I, I'm so glad that he he did that. So um, if there is no one else, because um, Allie's connection is just not um, going to allow her to come up and speak today, and hopefully we'll be able to hear from her in our next space. But uh, the folks who are here uh, still on the stage, I want to give um, uh, Mark an opportunity to give us some closing thoughts um, and words. Um, but um, Iqbal Namali is still up here. If you'd like to to add any um, additional thoughts to what you just said, I'll give yes. you a chance. And then Mark, and then my fabulous co-host. Thank you, Dee. Yeah. And I am very, very grateful to um, the vice president for being nimble and, you know, following up right away. You know, it spoke glowingly to her prosecutor days she really really was very clear about it that in trying to tell us the gaslight us by the insults you know that line was so apt and well delivered i'm very grateful that she went right away not waiting for the for the issue to slip over going right away to, to florida to remind everybody that we've been here and you can't in our very space and in our very space rewrite our history or be revisionist about the cruelty of of, of slavery so you that's I'm, I'm so proud of her and uh i want all of us to support her and um you know as white women you are women of your race no one elevates a race than its women and it's on you to talk to your folks it's on you to let them know that lies the spiritual forces that run the world those does not support or sustain lies and destruction. The best way to atone is to remember the past and not find ways to keep it hidden so people could repeat it. The best atonement is to move forward. But white supremacy wants to get stuck in the past so it could keep venting out its destructive force but it's on you the women of that race to call your people to a higher force even if your evangelical white supremacist pastors and evangelical churches will not do it i call on every white woman as much as our black mothers have raised our race is on you the women your men your boys have been fed extreme toxicity Barbie issue, what's going on? All the white men are all up. Look at what Jason Alden could boldly say. It tells you that white women have failed their children in letting them run amok with what they think life is. White women, do your job as mothers. Nurture your race. Tell them that nothing, nothing goes unpunished in the world. The world is a large ball of karma very huge one every yin will have a yang and every up will have a down tell them it's time to stop the ball is in your court white women speak up thank you thank you and that was so beautiful Amali. and i'm glad that you mentioned uh, jason aldean's um song here again i can always count on this community to just be on top of everything uh just a little fun fact you guys drug him sufficiently um and that song uh for the trash that it was and uh some articles written on it pointed out some of the atrocities that occurred at that site where he filmed it. I just want to throw this other additional fun fact in. This town is not that far from me. Um, I know people in that town. And this is also the hometown Steve. that headquarters, yes, that is headquarters to the sons of the uh, Confederate. 
Okay. And um, that is their headquarters is there in Murray County in Columbia. And they also are the, um, you know, they're like the brother organization to the UDC. They are also remember how, again, like this backlash, uh, the push after uh, the George Floyd uh, uh, protest and the monuments they were kind of going on simultaneously in some places, in some ways. And um, so during this push, um, this active um, push, the monument to the Confederate general, who was also the grand wizard of the KKK, uh, Nathan Bedford, was taken out of the public park in Memphis. And that statue is in possession of the Sons of the Confederate, which is down there in Columbia, where Jason did his song. So I just thought you guys um, might want to know that additional piece of history, too. So that town is there's history there. He knows that this is one of those towns and areas. I live in an area where this life lost cause ideology is very much celebrated and elevated. And it, it, they have a lot of reenactments and, and things to hold on um, to that ideology. And I appreciate you admonishing the white women, but Jason is actually a product of some of these white women and their teachings on purpose because the UDC, they were formed in you know, 1898 in 1909, they formed the chil children of the Confederacy. And that goal was to further instill their racist supremacist ideas into their children. So Jason likely is the grandchild of one of the children of the Confederacy. So some of them are teaching and some of them are learning, but not the good things. So I just wanted to, to throw that out there. <laughs> wow, that's a huge information. White women. <laughs> this is a call to you all. Spread love. It's not sustainable. It's not. We men where I come from are the bulk. They're just the whole society where I come from. They run from everything to everything. So white women, just wake up. Sometimes you fold some of your clothes never to use them again. Just fold this shit. Call your boys. Call your men. Be the ones in front of this change. A quick look at it. This is a backlash to Barack Obama, who in my society will always be called the son of a white woman. How? How dare you all have this backlash to the son of your sister, white women? Where I come from, as much as America want to tell Obama he's a black man, they will tell him the son of the white woman. Why would you all be reacting this way just because your sister's son was a president of America? You all go think we're in this together and we will always win. But it's on you to make sure that you don't sow the seeds of toxicity in your race. Thank you. Thank you, Igbana Mali. Uh, Mark, you're up next. Uh, well, thank you for the uh, chance to <clears throat> close out. Um, and I'll, I'll close out a bit personal. Um, I'm, the, I'm the grandson to veteran. We lost Are you there? Am I there? Am I back? Mark, yeah, okay. yeah. Just you, uh, I lost you at I'm the grandson. Yeah, I'm the grandson of a, a World War II veteran that came home back to Monroe, Louisiana and couldn't go home because there was a lynching and his, his family said, skip here, go, go to Houston. Um, and he made his way to California. I'm also, you know, I'm also a descendant of, of slaves that were from Haiti that were brought from West Africa. That's as far as I know, I go back and I, then I, everything else has to be traced through, um, DNA through ancestry.com. It's a proud history though. It's, it's a, it's a proud history because I, I was taught resilience and I was taught our, our survival and I was taught culture without books and, and on our on our family stories on uh, one side of the family and the other side of the family like you know like i said my grandfather was a world war ii vet fought for the country that he loved but didn't love him back when he came back so when i say when i say what i say when i talk how i talk 
it comes from a profound love. And it reminds me all the time of um, W.E. Du Bois's 1903 book called The Souls of Black Folks, where he talked about two-ness and the double consciousness. And if you guys haven't, if you haven't read this or you, you're not familiar with it, look up W.E.B. Du Bois, D-U-B-O-I-S. Somebody say, some people say Du Bois, I, I believe it's Du Bois, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but. Um, it's a book called Souls of Black Folk. He discusses the concept. It talks about the dual identity and perspective that black people have when they navigate um, themselves through this, this United States. Um, he described a tunis, which is a sense that you're always looking at yourself when you're in the mirror. But not, 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 a, not a real mirror, but like a, like a perspective mirror the eyes of others that describe a peculiar sensation um, meaning that African Americans see themselves both as they might wish to see themselves as individuals but also by a way society sees us too right so there's a there's a double identity uh, or tunis that he described and, and I, I'm gonna quote him too because I think it's important to, for this discussion one ever feels his tunis an American a Negro two souls two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. And the concept is, is a cornerstone of these discussions about race and identity in the United States, specifically with regard to black people, because it emphasizes the struggle to reconcile our personal and our societal identity, but also the challenge of facing racism and, and uh, racial inequality. Um, so we call it a tunis, and I think that's important to discuss in our conversation. I think it has a, a profound perspective what we're talking about now because we've been talking about tunis, and I think everybody on here feels their tunis. You don't even have to be black if you believe that everybody should be taught history the way it's truthful, the way it's it, it happened, because you believe that that's the strength of American vigor and power. You feel a tunis now too, not maybe like a black American would, but you do feel a tunis because everybody doesn't feel that way. They feel like, hey, look, I don't want to teach a history because it might make some people feel bad. Well, history has made me feel bad. Period. The whole damn time, our history has made black Americans feel bad. So, who are you talking about when you say you don't want to teach? Or you don't want to provide a curriculum that makes some students feel bad about their own identity. Black students have felt bad about their own identity their whole lives. Who are you talking about? And therein lies, and, and that's a rhetorical question, by the way. I think we can all answer it. Therein lies the problem. Therein lies the tunis that was written about 120 years ago by one of our great black scholars who did not pick up that skill in slavery. He was free, born a free man by enslaved parents, but he was born free. W. Du Bois did not pick up that benefit from slavery. So what we're talking about now resonates 120 years ago, y'all. And so this is, this, is the, this is the torch that carries on, and this is the fight that resonates not only back then, but it keeps on going now. This is why we always have to fight. We, are, have, we have to have this weekly talk. We always have to fight, and that's why the fight for all of our rights in our humanity is very important, especially with regard to the language that's being used by the Supreme Court, these arguments that are being made by these people that want America not to be what it can become as far as a more per perfect union. They want it to go back to something imperfect, and we ain't going to let that happen. Like Vice President Kamala Harris said, they're not going to gaslight us and make us go back to that. And like I wrote in my essay, like Dr. Marshall said, we ain't going to go back. We n it's not going to happen. One way or the other, you can call it Lincoln's second inaugural all you want, but we ain't going back. And I appreciate everybody. I've, I mean, I've learned so much from this. This has been so pedagogical. Like this space has been spiritually pedagogical. I mean, I'm, I'm serious. I've listened to everybody. And I, I, I love that I was able to contribute as much as listen and learn. Um, so I appreciate this, D. You always bring magic to the argument 
you bring magic to the moment you bring magic to the movement and i appreciate you so much for having the resilience that our ancestors show to keep us talking about this to keep it going because you've kept it going for years and i appreciate you for that and thank you for inviting me and let me express my feelings and and my passion and like try to contribute as much as i can well we love you and um, and you um are a joy to um, hear from and a joy, um, you know, to learn from. So I, we consider you to be a very valuable um, part of this community. And as I said, so many of us have different perspectives and skills that we can bring. And um, when we bring those um, areas of interest and passion as you do, I think that we can all learn from it. And it has been my experience that um, passion is contagious which is why I love for you to talk about it um, in your authentic way with your authentic passion, because I believe that it can incite, um, you know, passion in others. And if not passion, just curiosity. Um, and curiosity is a good thing because, you know, when you're curious, if you want to satisfy that curiosity, it will set you on a path to seek knowledge and information to satisfy it. And again, that is part of the reason I have these conversations to spark uh, inspiration and you always help to do that. So I just um, feel, like I said, blessed to have you to be available to us in the way that you are on such a regular basis. So I never take it for granted. So I appreciate you so much, brother. And with that, I am going to turn it over to my fabulous co-host who brings her own set of special skills like um, her background with unions. We're probably going to be drawing on that um, experience a lot as we are in the summer of strikes and indictments. So I um, appreciate you, Soul Sister, so much and want to give you an opportunity to share some last words with us before we close the space. Uh, thank you so much, Dee. Uh, the space did not disappoint. Uh, I, I began the space believing that we were going to have a vigorous conversation, and uh, it was delivered 10 times over. I mean, uh, just to be able to sit and listen to uh, the knowledge, the history, the wisdom, um, and the ex personal experiences and accounts by uh, the people in this community is um, inspiring, and I'm not gonna I'm not I'm not gonna sit and pretend that I don't rely on this community uh, for my own um, instances when I need to also uh, feel empowered and uh, be. Be certain that we're 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 going to keep fighting, and eventually make gains in in uh, truly realizing the democracy uh, that this country promised us. Um, some days it's hard. I'm not gonna lie. I have I have my days just as much as the next person. Um, even if I am able to sit here and. Um, add to the space um, or, or uh, you know, give truths and, and uh, hopefully some some information that uh, uh, people weren't aware of. I still have my own struggles, but this community, this space is what allowed me and, and, and affords me um, the inspiration to keep going. And, and, and it's just amazing to me. Uh, I did put... It, now I'm switching gears um, because I'm not. <laughs> if I keep going, I'll just keep going. Um, I want everyone to um, make sure that they check um, what's up in the nest and in the threads because there's a lot of good information. Um, and I hope that we were able to capture uh, all of the links that, that will help people moving forward. And um, really, uh, we have a battle on many fronts. Uh, that is has begun, you know, uh, as soon as that man got the the last man, the former guy, um, was 
elected into office and it's not going to stop. Um, I don't, I, I don't see him uh, being able to turn back the tides of uh, gaining control of this country again, but I'm not going to pretend that it's not a possibility because there's a battle here on many fronts. So it's not just confronting the people who may not uh, look like us or, or um, share any similar qualities. It's also correcting the people within our own communities and hopefully teaching them um, a better way for us to achieve everything that we need to to ensure democracy in this country. And um, that really has to be the single message. Uh, it's not the only one, but it is the single most important one that we, we have to instill in people. And we have to get people inspired to get to the polls. And, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of inspiration um, due to all of the detrimental legislation coming out of um, these state houses, that especially the ones that are controlled by the GOP. I am blessed enough to be in a state where, you know, uh, a week ago on July 18th, the government, uh, the governor um, signed uh, legislation that helped further ensure and protect voting rights. But not everyone is living where that is happening. And we have to make sure that we get out of our bubble and and understand that this is this is about all of us and we are all in it. So yeah, great. Uh, thank you, Politics Girl, for for making your video and coming out. I really do appreciate it. It might be late, but at least you did it. Keep doing it. I don't. <laughs> there's just really no more excuses to not have these hard conversations and uh, make these strong stands. It, it's I, I'm not going to let up on it, and I hope that you all don't either. Um, and let's just keep coming together because this is this space um, and and this community is helping to drive us in the right direction to advocate for democracy. Thank you so much. Thank you um, again um, for bringing some great information to um, us and the space today on um, unions, um, what they're doing now and, and generally in principle, how they work and how important they are. It is something that we're going to continue looking at because let's not uh, forget that the three basic tenets of this um, dark money uh, right-wing libertarian push. One, no taxes. Two, no regulation. Deregulation of everything, privatizing everything. And three, unions. They don't want unions. And all of those things speak to, like, group power, you know, as our vote does. Our vote speaks to individual power that together... Uh, constitutes group power and they are seeking to destroy it in every way that they can. I want to call your attention to um, a um, video that um, I put up that that Rachel um, did on this um, 2025 project. I really do want you guys to to look at that and understand what's at stake. I know many of you in here do, but I know that you all engage with people who don't, who are not as engaged um, and tuned in as we are to the news and, and the political climate, but they are people who can vote and we need to make sure um, that any obstacle they may have or thoughts they may have um, about not voting uh, someone speaks to it and speaks to it in a way um, with facts and information that can help uh, to persuade them and change their minds. So, again, that's part of, you know, my efforts here and the conversations and the resources that um, I try to share and to amplify from others who, who share those things. Um, so that is why I keep trying to drill down and give many examples of the stories and the connection of the UDC um, and this lost cause um, 
agenda. It's all tied together, and it's all really under the big umbrella of white supremacy. You know, surprise, surprise, no one is. But we need to point it out because sometimes, because they have, you know, the UDC uh, worked for over a century, you know, like 130 years of minimizing our history and revising it and twisting it. So um, we are living with the results of their work today in the hearts and minds of some of these people who are now politicians, lawmakers, teachers, and what have you, you know, who all stem from the work that they did. And so I keep talking about them because I want and need people to understand that the Moms for Liberty is just the modern day iteration of that. Uh, people were not as aware of the UDC. I mean, the ones that were, they embraced it. And um, But now from a historical perspective, we can see how effective they were. Like people may have looked at their individual um, activity, dismissed it, and, and maybe had some gains in one area over a textbook fight or this or that. And I need people to understand that these little fights in these little communities are much bigger than that. And their effects can be more lasting than today, this week in the news, or next year, because what they are seeking to do is to truly indoctrinate our children in a way um, that allows them to uh, create the type of country and, and governance that they want and um, blindly, you know, lead people into this direction, some of our own people. You know, so we we need to be aware of how insidious this is, how it works, all the mechanisms and the people who are working uh, those levers um, who's behind them. We're we're drawing back the curtain on the wizard, so to speak. And I want to keep doing that. And I appreciate you guys coming, speaking, sharing and amplifying um, that message and that information. I have no doubt that you will continue to do that. And I just want to thank you all uh, who have come in to listen to us today. All of those who participated actively, spoke, shared things so beautifully and so um, important. Mark, uh, Black Stem, Dr. Marshall and Iqbanamali and, um, you know, um, others. And I know that you're having conversations outside of this space and in your personal life. And, you know, you're on Twitter doing what you need to do to combat, combat nonsense and lies and, and that sort of thing, too. We, we, we need to continue to do this. We must. Um, because this truly is the fight of our lives. And it is up to every generation, like the civil rights movement. That was my hero's generation, um, uh, John Lewis. You know, that that's when he got activated. And uh, he spent his life uh, fighting for this cause. So um, I am just really picking up the mantle that he and others like him um, carried for us so that I, this little black girl, could go to school and get an education um, that was equal to the other people in this community because um, I'm going to share just a little bit of my personal history and story, which I have done before, because I am the direct, the immediate um, recipient of the fight that they fought. I went to school right after it was uh, Brown was passed. And um, in my state, it was still not fully implemented with it when it went into when I went to school, but they couldn't stop me. But I want you guys to know this again is where history is, because technically, legally, Nashville, their their schools, you want to know when they were fully, fully declared integrated, you'd be surprised. Nineteen. 98. Yes, yes, yes. That's how long it took them to get there because they drug their foot. They fought. They screamed. I want to talk about the story of, um, oh gosh, what is the, the community? I'll be posting stuff about it, but there was a community in Virginia, Prince something, but they closed the whole school district down, all the schools for 
five years because they didn't want to integrate. So think about the community and the people who suffered during those five years. But we are a resilient people. Just like when they didn't want us to learn to read, people found ways. Uh, when they didn't want us in their schools, we went to our little decrepit, uh, ran down schools. We used those torn up school books and we still learned. We eventually wrote books of our own and we will continue because we are resilient. And it is going to take that same kind of resilience that black people have had in this country for all Americans who care about freedom and democracy. It is time, this is your generation, and um, for you to continue picking up that mantle because as we uh, are picking up the mantle from the civil rights movement, from the separate, uh, suffragettes, from Harriet Tubman, from Ida B. Wells, and all, we are carrying forth their mantle. Just as we carry forth their mantle and their banner, trust and believe the UDC have people who are carrying forth theirs. <laughs> Moms for Liberty is one. And as Mark Elias continues to say, we have to be as forceful in our fight for democracy and as invested as they are in their efforts to destroy it. And I just want to leave you again, as I do every advocacy arena space, um, these encouraging words because um, it is only going to get worse because they, they are like a rat in a corner. This is their last dying opportunity. Because here's what they have already said to us. Like, they know that if Joe Biden gets another four years and then Kamala Harris gets um, elected, that will be 12 years of democratic governance. They do not want that because then we will be able to and, and 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 if we are able to gain control back of the house keep the senate and um, take over some more states or at least have a more balanced government in these states we can codify we can institute changes that they cannot undo at least for a long time so again the importance of voting um, and continuing um, in this fight. And I just want to leave you with the words um, that, like I said, it's a reason this is my pen tweet. Because you guys know, since 2016, our country has been, uh, whew, we've been through all kinds of things. We are continuing. Some of them are getting worse. Um, and I know that we have been through rough and tough times before. So I look to people who navigated those rough and tough times, who saw victories for us. I look to them for wisdom and for encouragement um, to continue. Um, and John Lewis's words do that for me. I hope they do it for you. And that is, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful. Be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. So that's what we do when we come here on Mondays. We're making noise and good trouble. We're going to keep doing it. And I just want to leave you all with wishes for a fabulous week ahead, um, as much information and energy as your hearts and minds can hold to continue in this fight for our democracy. And I'm just going to leave it there um, and say peace and blessings for a wonderful rest of your afternoon and a great week ahead. And so sister and I will see you back here next week at the same time for more great conversation and topics. And um, uh, just also remind you guys, look for me on these other apps uh, because I do try to take our conversation to my um, uh, other platforms, my podcast on um, the Apple podcast and on um, 
what's the other one, Spotify. And um, because, again, not putting all of our ed- eggs in one basket, especially these imp- important eggs like this, these conversations that I know can help uh, teach people, inspire people, um, and just lay down, you know, another marker in um, history for us. So keep doing the great work that you're all doing. We know X doesn't want us to be great, but we will not be deterred. Stay strong, everybody. See you back here next week.